All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Animal and Natural Resource Law Review's 2023 Symposium. My name is Becca Sutton, and I am a third year law student at Michigan State University. This year, I have had the absolute honor of serving as the managing editor for the Animal and Natural Resource Law Review, which has provided me with the opportunity to plan today's symposium. The Animal and Natural Resource Law Review is proud to be one of only three journals nationally that is dedicated to animal law topics. Since the journal's creation in 2005, a series of law students dedicated to promoting animal and natural resource issues in the legal field have worked under the advisement and direction of Professor David Favor to produce 17 published volumes thus far. In addition to our annual publication, we also host an annual symposium centered around a topic related to either animal or natural resources law. This year, we are incredibly honored to present to you all our 2023 symposium, which is entitled The Cross-Section of Animal Law in the First Amendment. The focus of today's symposium is on the intersection of free speech issues and animal advocacy. Some of the topics we plan to cover include the obstacles animal advocates face in their pursuit to protect animals. This will include censorship and punishment issues. We're also gonna be discussing litigation surrounding alternative protein products and animal welfare and raising claims on product labels. Today's symposium will be comprised of two different panels and a presentation by our wonderful keynote speaker, Joanne MacArthur. You can expect each panel to run about an hour and 10 minutes in length. Um, there's gonna be approximately a 20 minute question and answer session at the end of each panel. There will also be time for a brief question and answer session following our keynote speaker's presentation as well. Uh, throughout the presentations, you can feel free to use the little Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen to post your questions. Just know that we will get to all of the questions once all of the panelists have finished their presentations. Now, here to help me moderate our symposium this year is our wonderful social media coordinator, Kat. Kat, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Kat Rajai. Um, I'm a current second year student at Michigan State College of Law. Um, I am the social media coordinator and also an associate editor on the Animal and Natural Resources Law Review. Really excited to be a part of this and, and hear all of you speak today. Thanks so much, Kat. So if anyone has any questions or concerns throughout the symposium, please feel free to use the chat function to message either myself or Kat, and we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. Lastly, before we get started, I do want to encourage everyone to follow us on social media for updates on our future events, especially our next symposium. So you can find us on Instagram at MSU underscore ANRLR and on Facebook as Animal and Natural Resource Law Review at MSU College of Law. Now, without further ado, I wanna go ahead and get things started with our very first panel of the day. This panel is entitled Challenges for Conscious Consumers, Alternative Protein Products and Animal Welfare Labels. This panel is gonna focus primarily on labeling laws, including animal welfare claims on labels, regulatory authority over labeling, and litigation surrounding plant-based products. We are incredibly grateful to have five wonderful panelists serving on this panel today. Each panelist has prepared a presentation they will give. And as I, as I said earlier, at the end of the presentations, we will have the Q&A session. So as the presenters are talking, if you have a question, go ahead and drop it into that Q&A function and we will get to it at the end. Now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce all five of our panelists. So our first panelist is Jessica O'Connell. She is a partner at Covington and Burling LLP. She has engaged with Congress on cosmetic and drug legislative efforts and alternative meat and other food labeling requirements. Additionally, she has represented clients in both FDA and FTC investigations. Jessica has specific expertise regarding the regulatory framework for alternative protein ingredients and products, organic labeling and clams, claim substantiation requirements. She also previously served as an associate chief counsel in the FDA's office of chief counsel. Our second panelist is going to be Amanda Howell. She is a managing attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. She works to combat humane washing, unconstitutional ag gag laws, and the animal agriculture industry's attacks on plant-based foods. 
Prior to joining ALDF, Amanda also co-headed the food law practice at the Stanley Law Group and focused on state and nationwide class action litigation. Our third panelist will be Madeline Cohen. She is the senior regulatory attorney at the Good Food Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply by accelerating the world's transition to alternative protein products. Madeline leads GFI's regulatory and litigation strategies related to fair labeling of alternative proteins. She works to ensure that alternative proteins have a level regulatory playing field and are not burdened by unfair and unconstitutional labeling restrictions. Her areas of expertise include constitutional law, alternative protein regulation, and litigation. Our fourth panelist is going to be Adrienne Craig. She is a staff attorney with the Farmed Animal Program at the Animal Welfare Institute. She received her JD and certificate in animal law from Lewis and Clark Law School in 2019. Upon completing a two-year term as a judicial clerk in the Washington State Court of Appeals, she joined AWI, where she focuses on establishing protections for farmed animals in long distance transport, strengthening state regulatory oversight of on-farm practices, and improving federal oversight of animal raising claims on product packaging. And last, but certainly not least, our final panelist is Stein Van Osh. He is a staff attorney in the Animal Protection Law Team at the Humane Society of the United States. At HSUS, he focuses on farm animal welfare issues, such as organic farm welfare standards. Prior to joining HSUS in 2022, he was counsel in Latham and Watkins DC office, where he specialized in environmental and chemical regulatory law. Now I would like to go ahead and welcome our very first panelist, Jessica O'Connell, to go ahead and get us started. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen right now. Is that good? Okay, thanks. So uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here and I'm looking forward to hearing all of the, all of the discussion today. Um, I think I'm gonna start out just talking about kind of the US regulatory framework and particularly from a federal perspective. And the reason I think it kind of makes sense to start from this point is really you know, where the federal government acts and where the federal government doesn't act really influences what happens at the state level. And right now in this space, particularly in the, in the labeling of alternative protein products and the development of those products, the states um, is where a lot of activity is. And, and you'll hear a lot of interesting updates about what's happening in the states. It's happening in the states because there hasn't been kind of as much done at the federal level, which is often the case. And so I'm just going to do an intro into kind of how these products are regulated from the federal level, where the FDA and USDA kind of have stepped in and where and why there's space at the state level for, for everything that's been happening so far. Um, so I'll start first with just who are the, the regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction here, why, how do they regulate it, and then kind of thinking about what they've said comes next and, and what recent activities have been there. So when we think about federal food regulatory law, there are really four key agencies that come into play. There's FDA, USDA, EPA in certain circumstances, and then FTC. Um, I'm gonna focus today on FDA and USDA because they're really the ones that have, over, have oversight over labeling. And that's a lot of what's gonna be kind of come up in the discussion about the state level activities. Um, but I think in particular, FTC is also important to note um, they have jurisdiction over, over advertising of mm -hmm. products, and so that sometimes includes labels and labeling, and there's an agreement that they have with FDA about shared oversight over certain products. Um, but I'll talk mostly about FDA and, and USDA. So FDA has broad oversight over food. They regulate the safety of, of food and also the labeling of food. And so the, their statute, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, gives them the authority to, to take action against products with labeling that is false or misleading in any particular. So that, that's quite broad. Um, FDA has authority over a lot of meat products, except um, for kind of the standard meat and poultry products. And so if there's game meat, if there's other products that, that kind of aren't beef, um, chicken, pork, then FDA might have authority over those, but FSIS has the authority over kind of the, the very kind of typical meat products that, that we consume. 
FDA also has authority over most seafood with the exclusion of, of catfish. Um, so what FDA's regulations require is that there has to be a statement of identity on every, every food product that's sold. That statement of identity is the name of the product and it's what tells consumers what the product is. It's often not the biggest piece of information on the label. And so I have two examples here of what the statement of identity for a product is. So the Beyond Burger, um, which many of you may be familiar with, the statement of identity is not Beyond Burger, it's plant-based patties. And so it's qualified with plant-based and then that's a statement of identity in red there. Um, for Miyoko's vegan butter, vegan butter is not the statement of identity. The statement of identity is cashew and coconut oil spread. And so FDA's regulations require that each food product that's sold has a statement of identity that appears on the front of the pack and tells consumers what that is. If FDA has kind of described by regulation what the statement of identity is, then it, the, the food has to be labeled with that precise phrase. If FDA hasn't, then it has to be labeled with the quote common or usual name. And most food that's sold in the US is labeled with the common or usual name. Um, ingredients also have to be declared with a common or usual name and then that's in the ingredient list that's on the back of the pack. So what is the common or usual name? This is something that comes up quite a bit and it comes up in some of the state discussions as well um, that, that again, you'll hear about later. So it's a name that has to accurately identify or describe in as simple and direct terms as possible, the basic nature of the food or its characterizing properties and ingredients. And so there's you know, similar products could be labeled with somewhat slightly different common or usual names and that's okay. There's not one kind of very clear common or usual name for categories of products, but it has to tell consumers what the product is. And, and that's really the basic question. It also has to distinguish the products from other products that it's not similar to. And so we see the use of qualifiers, we see the use of flavors or identifying key ingredients in a product as part of the common or usual name for that reason. Um, and that's kind of a critical point that's come up in the discussion of how to label alternative protein products. So products, you know, dairy products that are not from, um, you know, kind of a traditional source or meat products that are not from a traditional source is how can the name of the product make clear to consumers what its, what its source is. There are certain common or usual names that are established by regulation. And there's a couple of examples here, just, just as examples, but most are not. And so when a common or usual name hasn't been established by regulation, it's the, the discretion of the company marketing the product to, to you know, figure out what the common or usual name is and to put that on the product label. Um, this issue has kind of most recently come up in, in FDA's guidance on the labeling of plant-based milk and plant-based milk alternatives is the phrase FDA uses. And so this is something that there's been kind of a push for FDA to address for some time, both by the dairy industry and, and in part by producers of alternative products as well um, to address kind of what the appropriate naming convention is for plant-based milk alternatives. And so just recently, um, a few last month, FDA put out a draft guidance on the labeling of plant-based milk. And it gives kind of certain criteria for how producers and marketers should develop the common or usual name of plant-based milk alternatives. Um, and so what FDA said that there, the word milk can be used, um, there should be a qualifier to identify the plant source of the food. And that qualifier needs to be specific enough to tell consumers what that source is. And so it shouldn't just be plant-based or non-dairy, but should be sufficiently descriptive by identifying the source. Um, FDA also in this guidance and kind of a more, um, I think maybe surprising or controversial um, recommendation recommends that companies that are marketing products that have a nutritional difference from kind of conventional cow's milk identify those key nutritional differences on the front of, front of the pack as well. And so that's an additional recommendation that FDA made. Um, this is a guidance, and so it's not binding on anyone, and it's a draft guidance, which means FDA will accept comment on it um, and will perhaps ultimately issue a final guidance, but it is intended to reflect kind of how FDA is thinking about this issue at the, at the time. Um, we've also heard from FDA they're going to be issuing a similar draft guidance on the labeling of plant-based meat alternatives um, that's been in development, but, but it, there's not kind of a clear date of when that will come. 
So moving on to USDA, like I said, USDA has jurisdiction over certain meat and poultry products. Um, and so kind of the most commonly consumed meat and poultry products in the US. Um, USDA has exclusive jurisdiction over the labeling of those products. And so they get to review those labels and assess the naming of products that, that, that USDA regulates. Like FDA, USDA has kind of the same framework for that statement of identity and what the name of the product is. And they have a number of standards of identity in their regulations that are very, very specific. And so I have here an example of the hamburger standard of identity, which I think is interesting just because you know, in practice, we see the word burger used very broadly, but, the, but USDA has established a very specific uh, naming convention for hamburger and, and what that means. Um, so this is just an example of how USDA has approached it. In the cultured meat space, um, USDA will have oversight over the labels of certain cultured meat products that, that are meat or poultry that, that fall, would traditionally fall under USDA jurisdiction. And they will have to, and they've indicated they'll develop kind of a naming convention for those products. So I mentioned earlier FTC, which I'm not going to spend really any time on, but it has authority over advertising. And so FTC can broadly look at claims and some of the claims that we'll hear discussed kind of later today um, to, to ensure that they're truthful and not misleading and, and has in recent years in particular focused a lot on environmental benefit and sustainability claims. So uh, the reason a lot of this is relevant is preemption and when preemption can come into play. And, and the preemption analysis, particularly from an FDA perspective is somewhat complicated. And I'm not gonna to dive into the details of that in, in this kind of intro, but I do wanna highlight that there's a difference between FDA's authority and USDA's authority in this space that can impact state strategy and, and how state laws can kind of come into play and impact these federally regulated products. Um, so from an FDA perspective, there's a statutory provision that preempts certain state requirements where there's kind of a specific FDA requirement in place. And so the language here is no state can establish or continue in effect any requirement that's of the type required by a certain section of the FDCA. And that section is a section that requires that common or usual name on a product um, if that requirement is not identical to the requirement of such section. This there's other preemption provisions that are similar for different FDA labeling requirements. And these have been interpreted in varying ways um, over time by courts and also by FDA itself, um, that of the type language in particular and how broadly that can be read. Um, there's a decent argument that can be read to apply to the name itself in the common or usual name convention. Um, but as I noted earlier, FDA doesn't, hasn't established specific common or usual name requirements for these products. And so that can be a bit challenging. Um, from a USDA perspective, USDA has pre-market review authority over these pro over products it regulates, and so it reviews and approves those labels and has a stronger preemption provision as well in its statute. And so historically, um, if a label has been reviewed and approved by USDA, there's a good preemption argument that states can't step in and regulate. I just wanted to note too, just kind of federal activity from a legislative front. In 2020, there were bills that were introduced, introduced in both the House and the Senate that were bipartisan that would have required a qualifier for alternative meat products. Um, it would have required the name imitation meat food product or imitation product to be on the label of products that are designed to appear as a meat food product but don't contain any meat. Um, so this is really targeted at the plant-based meat space and would have required the use of that word imitation. Uh, this legislation didn't move forward. It was right around the time of the start of the pandemic. And so there were a range of, of kind of factors that came into play, but there has been some activity at the federal level to address this. And the other thing I just wanted to note before we move into the state activity is why we've seen a lot of activity in this space. You know, FDA does have authority to regulate and regulate including the naming of products. And kind of in the 2010 and before that, we did see FDA kind of take some action against um, products where they thought the labels weren't accurate, where the names weren't appropriate or could be deceptive. FDA generally has not been enforcing in recent years and you can see the decline here in terms of where FDA has acted. And so there's been much less activity kind of at the federal level um, kind of giving input on when FDA thinks a name is appropriate or not um, or, or kind of taking action. 
And by contrast, what we've seen is a lot of activity at the state level through class action litigation where um, consumers are bringing challenges to state label or to labels under state consumer deception laws. And so that's really where we've seen the activity kind of really regulate the space and kind of seek to regulate the space. And so again, kind of thinking about why we're seeing so much at the state level. So what does this all mean? Like I said, we're seeing a lot of meaningful act state activity in this space. We're seeing state legislation that you'll hear a lot about. We're seeing class action litigation and also state attorney general attention, which you'll hear some about too. And so we're seeing a lot of focus on this kind of across the, across the states. We haven't seen federal regulators pay a lot of attention to, to naming in kind of a proactive outward focused way. And so you know, the states have had space to step in but we are anticipating more federal activity. And so there could be federal legislation. The likelihood of that is lower than state legislation, but it could happen. FDA has issued the plant-based milk alternatives guidance and will issue guidance on meat as well. And then USDA in the culture meat space in particular will be stepping in and kind of taking action. And so that could impact certain of the, of the state activities as well. So that's all I have. I think move on to Amanda, right? Hi, all. Let me just uh, share my screen and bear with me as I deal with this technology because I'm a bit of a Luddite. <laughs> um, is it, do you guys see it? Is it full screen for you? Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, thanks so much to Jessica. I think that gave really good context for what I'm gonna talk about. Um, Amanda Howell, I wanted to give a shout out too because I'm a native Michigander. So I'm from Kalamazoo. So it's nice to talk to <laughs> other people in place that I wish I still was sometimes. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to talk just about plant-based uh, meat products and focus on the state side of things. But as Jessica kind of lined up, I think a lot of these things do overlap. Um, and to the extent that I talk about any plant-based dairy products, um, I think that the important thing to keep in mind is that the uh, they have like very parallel naming conventions for those statements of identity. Basically, uh, whether it's a, a plant-based milk or plant-based cheese or plant-based burger or sausage, they all kind of use these same you know, structures for their statements of identity that have been very longstanding, um, basically having a qualifying term like plant-based or veggie or vegan in addition to that kind of dairy or meat term, which might be milk or cheese or sausage, so like a veggie sausage, for instance. Um, so bear with me as I, I try to steer clear of uh, any uh, mix-ups between the plant-based dairy and uh, meat sectors. Um, so I just want everyone to take a look at these uh, principal display panels or PDPs. Um, these have been on shelves, maybe you know, not beyond meat, but Tofurky is the company company as old as I am. Those they, those have been on shelves for almost four decades. I hate to say it, um, and it behooves these companies to make clear what their products are. It's, they have no interest in a, a consumer buying a product thinking it's and and thinking and wanting a, an animal based product, going home realizing it and feeling deceived. They're never going to buy that product again. Um, and I think people are increasingly realizing that their diets have effect on the environment, on their own health, on animal welfare. So people who are buying Tofurky products or Beyond Meat products or, or what have you, they're doing this on purpose. Um, and in accordance, <laughs> these companies are very clear, if you look at their PDPs, to make sure that consumers know that these are vegan, non-animal-based products. You see that through like plant-based slices and vegan hot dog. And those arrows I put in there to show you just how many times on a, on a package, these call-outs are made to show that these are, are vegan products. Um, Jessica mentioned that there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of movement at the state and federal level. Um, and that's pretty recent. Um, you know, I would say in the last like decade or so, maybe a little bit before for the uh, plant-based milk side of things. Um, Yet these products have been on dirt on grocery store shelves for decades and decades, like I just said. So like, why, why is there a concern all of a sudden about consumer confusion if these products have been labeled this way for decades without any movement from FDA or anyone else who regulates a FTC, there haven't been consumer protection lawsuits. Um, and I would argue you just have to follow the money. Um, 
plant-based meat and dairy alternatives have grown exponentially um, in recent years. These statistics are a little bit old, so I think it's even bigger than that. And like one thing you can see is dairy milk sales decreased and plant-based milk sales grew. Same thing has happened uh, with the plant-based meat side of things. Things that used to be kind of like a, seen as a crunchy uh, periphery market have, uh, and I'm sorry for the pun, taken a real bite out of uh, the animal-based meat sector. And so I think as a result, um, suddenly you get lobbyists from the National Cattlemen's Association and the state uh, affiliates saying to FDA, saying to USDA, you know, you have to do something about this. Consumers are confused. We're very concerned about consumers here being confused. Uh, they're not They're not at all asking for protectionist laws, right? Wink, wink. Um, as Jessica said, uh, there are applicable labeling laws that have been longstanding that uh, govern the uh, marketing and labeling for plant-based meat products. As you see, there's just like an onion <laughs> of uh, different layers of laws that basically say the same thing repeatedly. FDA has long had this uh, false or misleading. It prevents any labeling that's false or misleading in any particular. That applies for all food products, including obviously plant-based meat products. So they already have to comply with that. They're, so they're not, again, trying to mislead consumers. And if they were trying to mislead consumers decades ago, FDA probably would have done something about this under the section 21 USD 343A. Um, even though they're not governed by USDA, USDA has the same provision. Um, and there are also state laws. A lot of states have um, incorporated or have their own kind of like state version of the FDCA that say the same thing. Anything that's false or misleading in any particular is prohibited. They also have state um, unfair and deceptive acts and practices laws, consumer protection laws, more commonly known, um, that would also enable consumers who are misled or if there's like fraud or, or misleading labeling to, you know, basically hold companies accountable and stop that. So this is a long-winded way of saying um, companies <laughs> have no motivation to mislead consumers and there are lots of laws that already prevent consumers from being misled. Um, and here are some of those uh, state consumer protection laws for, for reference. Um, so I'm not just asserting this like willy-nilly that consumers aren't misled. Uh, ALDF did public records requests to a lot of the states that were responsible for the first labeling laws asking, you know, what evidence do you have? And do you have consumer complaints? Um, the first state, Missouri, that passed from these laws uh, said that they had not a single consumer complaint. And yet they felt it necessary to pass a ban on language, a ban uh, preventing plant-based meat products from using certain terms, meat, meat terms. Um, and then you look at the empirical evidence that exists, and that confirms these assertions that I'm making that nobody's confused with plant-based meat label conventions and naming conventions. Um, you know, there is this uh, Gleckel survey that exists, and not only did the, the survey find that consumers are not confused, that's kind of the first conclusion. The second con conclusion I find a little bit more interesting, which is, in fact, when plant-based companies and labels have to omit terms like sausage. So instead of calling something like a vegan sausage, if they were to have to call it things that the meat industry is kind of pushing for like a tube or for a veggie burger, a puck, uh, consumers unsurprisingly are actually more confused. <laughs> I wouldn't know necessarily what to do with a puck and that I could eat it like a burger. Um, and then you're, if we're keeping in mind that whole idea about following the money, like what would animal-based meats have to offer if consumers didn't even know what products were on shelves and, you know, had to have these unpalatable names like puck or tube. Um, one distinction between uh, plant-based milk products and plant-based meat products that I want to call out is the fact that there ha have been a couple, uh, several, in fact, uh, consumer protection lawsuits about plant-based milks saying that reasonable consumers are confused by them. I think Maddie is actually going to talk about that a bit later, but I'll just, I just want to flag that there actually haven't been any consumer protection lawsuits for plant-based meat products that I'm aware of. And my theory on that is because I think it would not pass the laugh test. Uh, it's an objective standard. Uh, you know, a lot of things survive the motion to dismiss, um, but I don't think any judge worth, worth their salt would say it's reasonable at all that it's it's likely at all that a reasonable consumer is likely to be misled by something that is called like a, a vegan sausage and we're misled into thinking it contains meat so we haven't even seen that those test cases i think because it just would not pass that laugh test and it so deeply strains credulity 
Um, I think Jessica did an excellent job already kind of giving all of the context in terms of what's happened at the federal level. I kept the slide in though, because what I really wanted to say is uh, what happened in terms of the history here is these uh, cattlemen's associations and National Cattlemen's Beef Association, all these like meat lobby groups started out kind of barking up the wrong tree at the federal level. And they've been pushing for uh, uh, action from uh, federal agencies for decades. And a funny thing is the US Cattlemen's Petition to USDA asking them to do something about plant-based meats and USDA doesn't govern plant-based meats, FDA does. So I thought that was kind of funny, but maybe I'm just a dork. Um, so what happened is after all this uh, federal kind of push, they turned to the state. And unfortunately for uh, consumer right to know, consumer right to have access to healthful foods, unfortunately for plant-based meat companies and innovation and sustainability, I'm getting ranty, I'll stop. But unfortunately for all these things, uh, they've had a lot more uh, success at the state level. Um, back in 2018, Missouri passed this law. It's really terribly written. It's and it's also incredibly broad. It's just saying no person can uh, misrepresent a product as meat if it's not derived from harvested production livestock or poultry. What does that mean? Like, if you're a producer, how do you comply with that law? Um, and scarily, uh, I don't think that's the word, but it's terrifying. Uh, this is actually a criminal statute, and uh, they're tasking 115 county prosecutors in Missouri with enforcing this. So 115 different county prosecutors in Missouri who might be ranchers themselves, are then going to somehow determine what misrepresenting a product as meat is. And they could throw the CEO of Tofurky into jail for a year and fine them. I think is it $500 per violation per day? It's it's would put a, a company out of business. It's enough to chill speech. It's enough to um, have companies say, do we even want to sell in Missouri? And that's a question of whether they can even avoid Missouri markets. Because another problem is this is not just applying to the labels of products, it applies to the marketing of products too. So take a look at the internet. How would a company avoid Missouri markets and avoid criminal liabilities under the statute? Um, quick on the heels, Arkansas passed this law. It is even more terrifying, I would say, even though I think it's a civil uh, law. Um, it's again, I think $1,000 per violation per day. It's either five or 100 or 1,000 for each of these. Um, so, you know, ruinous civil penalties um, and it, it's actually quite a big, long statute instead of this just one phrase, um, but it's very all encapsulating in terms of scope. Um, it bans representing a product as meat, again, if it's not from a dead animal. Um, it has a whole host of things that you can't represent beef as something, you can't represent blah unless it comes from a dead, dead animal. Um, and then they have this like huge catch-all that's hilarious if you, you know, just want to throw your hands up and laugh. It says, they also can't utilize a term that's the same as or similar to a term that's been used or defined historically in reference to a specific agricultural product. Like, wh what does that mean? <laughs> defined historically? Um, and, you know, you might be confused. I'm confused. I think people trying to comply with this would be. Um, but then you look at where this is coming from. And actually, this uh, was this law in particular was pushed forward by a uh, a rice farmer. And he was trying to go after cauliflower rice in addition to plant-based meats, which I think is very almost charming. Um, Louisiana kind of took a page out of Arkansas's book and having a very uh, like a, a laundry list of conduct, but also very like broad language representing a product as meat is deemed illegal. Um, same thing, can't go after, they're going after cauliflower rice and then same kind of like giant catch-all provision. Um, as you can see with the Louisiana, Arkansas and Missouri laws, these are all bans on speech, flat out bans on com truthful commercial speech. Um, and that's that's a pretty harsh and nuclear option, given that there's absolutely no evidence of consumer confusion. Um, you know, FTC I think has said that when there's concern about consumer confusion, the remedy is is more speech, not less. Kind of recommending disclosures instead of bans on speech. But you know, these laws just went straight for the for the ban. Um, I wanted to show uh, a bunch of other states that have similar types of laws. I've kind of created a dorky chart that says, you know, whether it's a ban or, or a disclosure requirement. Um, I, did I already, did I skip past the Oklahoma? Okay, so Oklahoma is a little bit distinct from the Louisiana, Missouri, and Arkansas laws. Um, it went for a disclosure required speech. 
um, and it says that they can't do these things, but it kind of has a carve out. It says that it won't plant-based meats won't be considered in violation as long as the packaging displays of the products derived from plant-based sources in a tech that's uniform in size and comments to the name of the product. The problem with this is it applies to marketing and labeling across the country, including like internet advertising that exists, you know, outside of Oklahoma. Um, it gets into that whole preemption issue that Jessica was mentioning um, because it, it tries to govern. Well, first of all, I think there's there's a, a, a confusion of vagueness thing in terms of due process clause, because we don't necessarily know what the name of the product is. When pressed, the state would not clarify if they meant statement of identity. They actually said, we don't think this is a statement of identity. Um, and so what's a product name? We don't know. Um, but if it does mean statement of identity, then that runs afoul of the express preemption provision of the FDCA, which brings a supremacy clause issue. Um, so all of these, I would say the first three laws that I flagged have First Amendment implications and due process clause void for vagueness implications. This Oklahoma statute, uh, because the standards that exist for disclosures versus bans that I think Maddie is going to talk about a little bit more, it's basically intermediate scrutiny versus rational basis scrutiny. Um, this is a, a stronger dormant commerce clause, uh, due process clause, and um, supremacy clause issue. So not to get too far in the weeds of constitutional law. Here's the, the list of ALDS constitutional challenges that have been litigated or uh, have already been uh, litigated to conclusion. Um, I know I must be running out of time, so I just want to flag again our, our causes of action, um, predominantly and very strong First Amendment causes of action in these cases. Um, bas basically, because commercial speech is protected as long as it's truthful and not misleading, and that's a central Hudson standard, um, the government just has to have a substantial government interest in restricting the speech. Courts won't look too askance at that, and they'll take kind of like whatever the state says is the interest at play. Um, the, the problem with these laws and the way that they are really shown unconstitutional where the state cannot meet their burden is the state ha cannot show that these bans on speech, flat out bans, uh, directly and materially advance any interest in preventing consumer confusion because no consumer confusion exists. Um, and then, so if that weren't enough and if they wouldn't fail under that, uh, we have the fourth prong of Central Hudson, which is asking states not to pass laws where restrictions are more extensive than absolutely necessary to achieve the interest. And again, the interest is pretextual. And then you have a ban on speech instead of a, a disclosure requirement or something like that. So it's way more extensive than necessary. Um, and just because I'm a bit of a jerk, I want to show some of the quotes from the legislative history of these laws. Um, and even though the substantial government interest cited is consumer confusion, this is actually what the uh, legislative history shows you know they're trying to protect their agricultural producers in the state unsurprisingly saying you know they want to protect the interests of their rice and their beef and protect our beef brand this has nothing to do with consumer confusion as i mentioned uh due process clause cause of action basically a person of ordinary intelligence doesn't have the reasonable opportunity to understand how not to run afoul of these laws um, and even though courts will if they can read out vagueness uh from these from any statue uh it's so so vague, like you don't know how represent as meat is, is what conduct is prescribed by that. I think it's pretty impossible to read out any vagueness in these really poorly drafted statutes. Um, for the Oklahoma case um, or the Oklahoma law, I did mention the supremacy clause and preemption. Um, and basically, again, it's just there's a, a express preemption provision of the FDCA. It's like 12 things that like you can't touch and it's stuff that's on the, the PDP, the principal display panel. And, and they do that so that there's a uniform standard that co companies can sell their products in, in every state and not to have to have separate labels for each state, which would, of course, mess with interstate commerce. So there's a reason that these provisions are expressly preempted. Um, and Thankfully for us, statements of identity, aka product name, maybe in the sense of the Oklahoma statute, is one of those express pre expressly preempted provisions. Did mention the dormant commerce clause. Uh, I'm going to basically cut this super short because it gets very uh, in the weeds. Um, but any laws that are discriminatory or wholly extraterritorial are basically per se invalid. And if they're not discriminatory on their face in a geographic context, or if they don't regulate wholly extraterritorial conduct, then you apply pike balancing basically where you compare the uh, putative local benefits with the burden on interstate commerce. And these, this is, these laws passed, that have been passed have a very excessive burden on interstate commerce and might even prevent uh, plant-based products from being sold at all because one state passed this law. So when you balance that against the pretextual concern about consumer confusion, I think that definitely 
ways in our favor. Um, final, I know I'm a little bit over time, but I wanted to say that uh, we've met with uh, pretty happy successes. Uh, Louisiana, we won on our motion for summary judgment. It was struck down on a facial basis. That's up on appeal right now. We had the oral argument in the circuit, uh, what, two months ago? Last month? I don't know. It's been time dilation. Uh, Arkansas, we also won on as applied basis, um, except for with that last one that I read about utilizing a term, blah, 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 that was struck down on a facial basis. Okay. I will pass it off to Maddie. I'm so sorry for uh, going over time, but I'll uh, look for any questions at the end. Okay, can you all see my screen okay? I can't tell if you can see it or not. Yes, okay. you can. Perfect. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, um, I'll kind of be discussing the flip side um, of these label censorship efforts, um, specifically those that arise for companies producing alternative milk and dairy products. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm the senior regulatory attorney at GFI. And for those that aren't familiar, um, GFI is a nonprofit think tank that works to catalyze the entire alternative protein industry. Um, and we work in science and technology, corporate engagement, as well as policy. Um, and before we kind of jump in, I just wanted to give a quick overview um, of what we're talking about when we're talking about alternative milk and dairy. Um, I think everyone is familiar with the plant-based products like oat milk and almond milk, um, but these labeling issues will likely also affect other technologies in the future. Now we have fermentation enabled dairy products that are um, made with real milk proteins, but they're produced through microorganisms like yeast um, that can excrete milk proteins without involving an animal. And then we also have cultivated milk, which would be similar to cultivated meat, where we're replicating the same biological process that's happening in an animal to create milk or potentially other dairy proteins um, directly from cells. Um, and since the pretty dramatic rise in the popularity of plant-based milk specifically in recent years, um, several states that have large dairy industries have been passing um, protectionist label censorship laws that are meant to usually prohibit the use of the term on any milk products that don't contain cow's milk. So far, um, a number of states have introduced bills like this, but the only ones that have passed have been in Louisiana, North Carolina, and Maryland. But interestingly, all three states have made enforcement of their laws contingent on future events. So the laws in North Carolina and Maryland are contingent on a threshold number of other states passing similar milk label censorship laws. And then in Louisiana, enforcement of that law is contingent on FDA itself initiating enforcement actions against plant-based milk producers for using the term milk on their plant-based products that don't meet the federal standard of identity for cow's milk. Um, but since neither of these precursor events has actually happened, fortunately, these laws are not yet being enforced. Um, and these types of laws are really unnecessary because as Amanda discussed, consumers just aren't confused by plant-based labeling. They understand the difference between plant-based milk and cow's milk. And states have predicated these laws on consumer confusion, but that's not a valid basis um, for any sort of speech restriction if they can't actually show that consumers are confused. Um, and several studies have shown that consumers can very easily distinguish these products and that using the term milk is actually helpful because it explains um, you know, the taste, the texture, the potential uses of these products. Uh, and FDA actually conducted its own consumer focus groups um, in the lead up to the recent plant-based milk labeling guidance that Jessica discussed. Um, and as part of their focus groups, they found that consumers absolutely don't confuse these plant-based products with cow's milk and that they're purposely buying them because they don't contain any cow's milk. Um, but unfortunately, this evidence hasn't really deterred either the plaintiff's bar or state governments from 
trying to prohibit plant-based companies from using the term milk. Um, so I'll go over a few of the key cases that have kind of litigated um, these issues um, and also some potential legal implications for challenging future restrictions um, on alternative milk and meat products. So um, the first is uh, Gitson v. Trader Joe's, a case out of the Northern District of California. Um, it was a class action suit that plaintiffs brought alleging that the name soy milk on Trader Joe's products um, violates the FDCA and therefore violates um, California's unfair competition law. And the plaintiffs argued that the name soy milk is false and misleading because the product doesn't actually contain cow's milk. Um, the court didn't find that argument plausible and, you know, following the consumer research said any reasonable consumer can understand that soy milk is a wholly separate product from cow's milk. The plaintiffs there also argued that soy milk violates the FDA standard of identity for milk, um, and the court disagreed, holding that Trader Joe's was not trying to hold itself out as selling cow's milk. They weren't pretending that their soy milk product was cow's milk. So there's no reason for that soy milk product to need to meet the FDA standard of identity that's specific to cow's milk. Um, in another uh, Northern District of California case, um, Ang v. White Wave Foods, the similar class action where the plaintiffs were arguing that names like soy milk, almond milk, and coconut milk um, violated federal law and therefore um, California's false advertising and unfair competition laws. And the court once again found that any claims that consumers were confusing these products for cow's milk was just not plausible. Um, the court found the idea that shoppers would only focus on the term milk and disregard the clear terms almond, soy, and coconut, um, quote, stretches the bounds of credulity. The court there also found that the plaintiff's claims were preempted by federal law. Um, the plaintiffs tried to argue that these plant-based milk products didn't meet the federal standard of identity for milk. And the court importantly said that the standard of identity for milk pertains to what milk is rather than what milk is not. And it doesn't make any mention of plant-based alternatives. So the federal standard of identity for cow's milk simply isn't relevant to issues surrounding these plant-based milk products. The court also held that using terms like soy milk, almond milk, and coconut milk accurately describe the nature of the food, which is what FDA requires for using a common or usual name for a food. So because the name complied with FDA regulations, any state requirements to the contrary were preempted. And this is just um, a great quote from Aang explaining why the claim that consumers believe plant-based milks contain cow's milk is kind of ridiculous. Um, under plaintiff's logic, a reasonable consumer might also believe that veggie bacon contains pork, flourless chocolate cake contains flour, or that eBooks are made out of paper. Um, moving on to another case that started in Northern District of California and was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit, Painter v. Blue Diamond. Um, there, the district court held that almond milk labels are not misleading just because they <clears throat> include the term milk. And um, the district court dismissed the case, again, holding that plaintiff's claims about the term almond milk are implausible and preempted, that no reasonable consumer could be misled by the defendant's unambiguous labeling. Here, interestingly, the plaintiffs also said that these products, if they want to use the term milk, should include a nutritional comparison to cow's milk, which is a bit similar to what we've seen in the recent federal guidance. Um, but the court there didn't buy that argument saying that as long as the almond milk product had factually accurate nutrition statements, um, a comparison wasn't required. Uh, moving away from kind of the class action cases, there's also been a few instances where states have tried to restrict the use of dairy terms either under their existing state consumer protection laws or under um, the FDCA. So um, Ochisi Creamery v. Putnam was an 11th Circuit case um, where a creamery in Florida was selling milk that wasn't fortified with any vitamins, including vitamin A. Um, it prided itself on selling kind of all natural milk and didn't want to use any additives. But under Florida law, skim milk has to be fortified with vitamin A. So the state instructed the creamery to stop selling its product and later offered to allow them to sell the product, but only if it was labeled as an imitation milk product. 
Um, so the Creamery sued, arguing that the state had violated its First Amendment commercial speech rights. Um, and as Amanda touched on earlier, um, potential violations of commercial speech are uh, evaluated under an intermediate scrutiny test set out in Central Hudson. And under that test, the government has to assert a substantial interest. Um, its speech restriction has to directly advance that interest and the restriction can't be more extensive than necessary to serve that interest. Um, here, the 11th Circuit held that the state had not passed the Central Hudson test um, and that despite any conflict between the way the creamery used the term skim milk and the way the state used, defined that term, it didn't necessarily mean the creamery's use of the term was inherently misleading. Um, the court found that most consumers assume skim milk simply means milk without cream, which is what this product was. Um, and the court held that the term skim, using the term skim milk um, or banning the use of the term skim milk wasn't appropriately tailored to serve the state's interest in combating consumer deception. And essentially it, it failed that last prong of the central Hudson test because it was more extensive than necessary in serving the interest of protecting Florida consumers. Um, a few years later, the Northern District of California upheld use of the term vegan butter on a plant-based butter product created by uh, the company Miyoko's Kitchen. The court there largely relied on the Ochizi case um, and held that even though there is a federal definition for the word butter, that doesn't make other uses of that word inherently misleading, which means that other uses of that word are potentially protected by the First Amendment. Um, the court emphasized that language evolves over time. So the fact that there's a federal definition of butter and because it's been used that way for a long time doesn't make newer, more colloquial uses of that word less accurate. Um, and ultimately the court held that the speech restriction violated the first amendment simply because the state couldn't demonstrate that consumers were actually confused by vegan butter labeling. And if confused, consumers aren't confused by the labeling, then banning the labeling can't be shown to directly advance the state's interest in preventing consumer confusion. So, you know, what is the effect of all these cases? I think the most important takeaway is that there is a really strong argument in favor of using terms that consumers easily recognize like milk or yogurt or butter or for meat products, terms like burger or sausage on these alternative products. If plaintiffs want to argue that terms are misleading or states want to restrict the use of these terms, they ultimately need to demonstrate actual consumer confusion to justify labeling restrictions. I think another important takeaway is that federal laws, regulations, decisions regarding food labeling do generally preempt state law. Um, but as Jessica touched on, the preemption provisions in the FDCA are not all encompassing. And also FDA sometimes uses non-binding avenues <clears throat> like guidance to communicate its views on labeling issues. And there is, um, it's more difficult to find preemptive effect in those kind of non-binding uh, guidances that kind of skirt the standard uh, rulemaking process. And that leaves us with the potential for a patchwork of varying state laws or varying levels of states enforcing federal laws against these products. Um, and finally, as Jessica noted, FDA did release its draft guidance on plant-based milk labeling. And even though it's not legally binding, it certainly could have an effect on how courts analyze these issues in the future, especially with um, respect to nutrition labeling. And that's all I've got. Okay, I think I am next. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adrian Craig, and I am the staff attorney uh, for the Farmed Animal Program at the Animal Welfare Institute. And today, I'm going to be talking about 
the universe of the regulation of labels on animal products. So buckle up folks, it's going to be really an exciting ride. Um, so I'm talking about the text and the graphics that appear on the packaging of meat, poultry, dairy, and eggs. So we're talking about the actual product here and not the alternative. And narrowing it down a little bit more, I'm talking specifically about animal raising claims, which are claims that, re that are um, specifically referring to the on-farm treatment of animals. So we're talking the diet, we're talking animal welfare and environmental stewardship claims, more holistic uh, regenerative farming, humanely raised, raised with care. We're talking about negative hormone use, negative antibiotic use, specific breeds, the USDA organic program or claims made specifically through the Agricultural Marketing Service process verified program, uh, and also living and raising conditions, which I'm sure folks have seen like free range, pasture raised, cage free. So for example, we've got turkey, a uh, turkey breast that says turkey raised without added hormones and turkey used is humanely raised, also no antibiotics ever. We've got milk that is pasture raised and grass fed. There's a kielbasa that is raised humanely. Well, the kielbasa itself was not raised humanely, but the animal, the derivative animal was. We have uh, some free range eggs and uh, ground beef that is grass fed, grass finished, raised on open pastures, and is agriculturally sustainable and environmentally friendly. So these are the claims that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'd like to pause to so apologize. We're about to go through quite a few acronyms, although the, the previous panelists have done quite a good job of teeing up the, the regulatory landscape for me. So I'm gonna skip through most of these. So we've already talked about the FTC, um, which uh, regulates advertising. And then we're, uh, when we're talking about specific animal products, primarily the USDA is charged with ensuring that the products are not misbranded, otherwise um, false or misleading. And that uh, primary oversight is divided between Food Safety Inspection Service, EPSIS, and the Agricultural Marketing Service. Although <clears throat> the Food Safety Inspection Service is the only sub uh, group of the agency that can define the claims on these products. And a brief note on eggs, just because we haven't really talked about that yet so far, both the FDA and the USDA um, oversee labeling on eggs, um, but neither has express authority to regulate the health or welfare of hens on farm as a label requirement. Only USDA graded eggs require uh, that there is pre-market approval of animal raising claims on labels. So if you see a USDA graded shield, then the claim on that package, free range, cage free, pastures, et cetera, is going to be um, verified by the Agricultural Marketing Service. I'm gonna skip dairy because we've already talked about dairy. Um, essentially, uh, there's no agency that has clear authority to regulate animal raising claims on dairy packaging. But what I focus on and what AWI focuses on is the um, labeling on meat and poultry products specifically and the regulatory oversight by EPSIS, um, who, like I said, is tasked with ensuring that those products are not false and misleading. So let's take a look and see how EPSIS has interpreted that mandate. So when a producer wants to sell a product with a certain claim, or as EPSIS calls it, a special statement or claim, which of course includes those animal raising claims that we talked about earlier. Um, a producer uh, has to submit the label to the labeling and program delivery staff for pre-market approval. So um, if the producer wants to use a broad or a holistic claim like the humanely raised, sustainably raised, they're first required to define that claim on the package or provide a website that defines that term. So for example, uh, um, Empire Kosher defines humanely raised on the package of its uncured chicken franks as meets Empire Kosher's humane policy for raising chicken on family farms in a stress-free environment. No indication of what stress-free means, of course. Um, or on this example that was prepared by FSIS, uh, hence the really high quality graphics, uh, you can see that free range is defined with the little asterisk as never confined to a feedlot. Um, so in addition to the explanation on the packaging and for more specific claims, the producer submits documentation for a desk audit. Um, so I'll just highlight uh, the important one of these, which is the second, uh, which is an affidavit explaining how the animals were raised to support that specific claim. 
Um, and then of course the last one is if there is a third party certification involved, then um, the certificate for that third party certification must be included. Of course, third party certifications are uh, companies that do on farm auditing uh, to independent standards that are typically uh, higher than industry standards. So some that you may have encountered are certified humane, animal welfare approved, the Global Animal Partnership or GAP program, and American Humane Certified. These all have their own logos that appear on the packaging. Um, but unless there is a third party certification, as this does not require um, any on farm auditing to confirm the validity or the veracity of these claims. So AWI has done an analysis of the regulatory oversight of these animal raising claims. We uh, requested through the Freedom of Information Act uh, 97 label claim files, um, including all of these that you see on the screen. And after going through those files, we um, found some things. Our key findings were first that for nearly half of the claims, the USDA was uh, unable to provide any application submitted by the pr producer for that claim. For 34 of those claims, the application was either uh, without relevant substantiation or insufficient substantiation. So in total, about 85% or 82 of those 97 claims lacked sufficient substantiation. So in many cases where there was what we would consider inadequate substantiation, uh, producers were submitting affidavits or operational protocols or other documentation indicating that they were only complying with minimum industry animal care standards. Um, we also discovered uh, the USDA asks producers to define these animal raising claims on product labels, but obviously, again, it doesn't assess the veracity or adequacy of those definitions that are provided. So, for example, um, with inadequate substantiation, uh, the label approval file for the Boar's Head Simplicity All Natural Roast Turkey Breast, which I um, showed at the beginning of the presentation, the producer substantiated the use of that claim uh, humanely raised with an affidavit claiming that its turkeys were raised antibiotic free and with documentation that they were raised to the industry level standards of the National Turkey Federation. So just really quickly, I'm gonna discuss what's above industry standard and what, well, what is industry standard? And so we can also discuss what is above it. Um, industry standard is something that we typically, uh, which is typically determined by trade associations. So beef quality assurance, common swine industry audit, uh, National Chicken Council and National Turkey Federation, as I, as I mentioned. So on this slide here, for example, we show on the right gestation crates, which is an industry standard practice where pregnant sows are confined for months during gestation. And on the left is a, what we would consider a higher welfare option um, that is uh, a group that is group ho sow housing where they're not confined for their gestation period. And then of course you would have a, what we would consider a high welfare um, sow raising operation where uh, sows are able to, um, uh, where they're not confined, they're allowed pasture access and they're giving nested material and uh, enrichment. And um, another example would be feedlots for cattle. Uh, industry standard is a feedlot with minimal regulation by the Beef Quality Assurance Program um, of stocking density, shade provision, and mud control, whereas a higher than industry standard would be, of course, either limiting or not allowing finishing on feedlots. Just to note the organic and the grass fed um, label claims do require that cows are actually raised on pasture and are not uh, finished in feedlots. Okay, so we've talked a lot about consumer perception. So getting into what the average consumer is thinking when they see these labels, we've conducted several polls, both ethically raised and humanely raised to a consumer mean higher than industry standard. So, um, you know, a majority of consumers, uh, you know, uh, so obviously raising animals at higher welfare standards is more expensive and higher welfare products carry a premium, yet customers are willing to pay more for these um, to varying degrees depending on the product. So the claims are what we consider value added. So the conclusion that we reached is that majority of consumers agree that food producers should not be allowed to use the claim he mainly raised on their meat or poultry product labels unless the producers have exceeded minimum industry animal care standards. 
So why does this matter? So given everything that we know about what consumers expect of the products bearing these claims and what kind of oversight FCC is providing for these claims, uh, the key takeaway is that consumers view these holistic comprehensive animal welfare and environmental stewardship claims um, as value added while FSIS approves the claims based on compliance with industry standard. So it's par for the course, you know, as we heard from Jessica, Amanda, and Madeline, that regulating agencies practices are not in line with consumer expectations. And uh, as far as why it matters, you know, the consolidation of agriculture in the country has led to a large percentage of small farms um, going bankrupt and small farmers uh, that are still existing can't afford to invest in higher welfare animal raising practices if they don't receive a price premium for their products. Um, and without the ability to differentiate themselves, small farmers are forced to either work under contract or for, for large corporations or go out of business. It also harms consumers. So large majority of US consumers say they care about animals, the way the animals are raised. They look to the product packaging, packaging for information about animal raising practices and label claims are one of the only cues that are available to consumers because consumers typically don't research ahead of time on websites before they go grocery shopping. So without meaningful claims, consumers are unable to make purchasing decisions that are consistent with their values. Lastly, it matters to animals, obviously, because farm animals are farmers are going to be less willing to invest in resources that um, resources to raise their animals to higher welfare standards if they're not receiving that premium for their products. So without meaningful animal raising label claims, fewer animals are going to be raised under higher welfare conditions. Um, just really quickly, AWI has done quite a bit to try to combat this false and misleading um, labeling regulatory scheme. We filed two rulemaking petitions. We filed four NED challenges, two FTC challenges, which are still pending. Um, we worked with members of Congress on two bills and one farm bill amendment to define animal raising claims. Um, we've supported legislation to fund farm and transition to higher welfare production systems. And we have urged FSIS to revise its label guidance, which it has agreed to do. And we are now just waiting for that to come down. And that is all I have. I would encourage everybody to, if folks are looking for higher welfare products, um, to check out our consumer food label guide, which is on our website. And we also have physical copies available. Thank you. Okay, I think I am up last. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I will also share my screen, which will be, oh dear, which one is it? That one. There we go. You should see the full view. Let me know if you cannot. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, I will be rounding this out uh, by discussing the using consumer protection regimes as tools to challenge misleading claims by ag and food industry about their animal welfare and environmental impacts. So this is part of the conscious consumers and animal welfare, welfare side of this panel. Um, these kinds of welfare washing or humane washing and greenwashing claims hide the true costs and abuses of animal food production from consumers, especially those who care about those issues and want to make better purchasing decisions. As Amanda and Adrian have already discussed, more and more people fall into this category. Bringing false and misleading claims to light helps protect both conscious consumers and animals as Adrian just went over. Um, I will use some examples today, mostly animal product related to help show how these legal tools can be used in practice for uh, advocacy. So, there we go. Um, this is what we'll be discussing today in a whirlwind high level manner. We only have like 10 minutes left. Um, given that the seminar is about the First Amendment, we'll briefly situate uh, consumer protection laws within that framework. And then we'll discuss what welfare washing and greenwashing are, why fighting it is important to the animal welfare movement, and we'll discuss some key general concepts and specific legal tools to combat misleading and welfare washing advertising like the FDC, which has come up several times already, uh, state laws and the Better Business Bureau. So the First Amendment doctrine is convoluted. You've already heard it a little bit. Um, but the currently generally accepted framework for commercial speech is that it is less protected than other speech. So on one hand, as Amanda has already uh, briefly touched on, is Central Hudson and its progeny, under which commercial speech, which is speech proposing a commercial transaction, so it's broad, can be regulated. Speech is not protected if it concerns unlawful activity or is misleading. That's the corner of First Amendment world in, in which consumer protection regimes that regulate false and misleading advertising operate. Otherwise, intermediate scrutiny is applied to commercial speech, and Amanda and many have already talked about that standard in the plant-based labeling context. 
On the other side, there is the Zotter uh, case and its progeny, which means commercial speech can be compelled to prevent deception or provide important factual information. So as Jessica and Adrian have explained, US and F USDA and FDA can compel producers to include information on, for example, a meat label, like you can see there. And if you've ever visited or lived in California, you are no doubt familiar with Prop 65 labels that are required to be on almost everything. And in 21, there was a huge 2021, there was a huge fight over whether or not meat products should carry such labels. What do the terms welfare uh, and humane washing mean um, and greenwashing? It depends on who you ask. Uh, the definition from the literature that I like is one on the slide. It is information disseminated by an organization so as to present an environmentally or environmentally or animal welfare responsible public image. To bring in business, companies like to present themselves as environmentally or welfare friendly, even if they're not really, because consumers increasingly care about these issues, as you just heard from other panelists. Challenging these kinds of washing claims can help expose real abuses and harms behind corporate practices, keeps practices, keeps companies honest, and helps consumers and animals. There's two examples on this slide. Uh, the left one is an obvious greenwashing example. I always like this one of a bottle that says, I'm a paper bottle, and then on the inside it is plastic. Um, on the right is a welfare washing example of a Davidson chicken egg carton that shows an, it's a little blurry image, but it shows an open field um, with happy chickens. Um, and then if you, in reality, the chickens were kept in battery cages and uh, HSUS um, challenged this one that's in, in Illinois. What are some of the general uh, advertising principles that apply and that uh, in, including to greenwashing and welfare washing and, and that we can use to challenge those, uh, those kinds of advertising? This slide has some basic principles like First Amendment law, the law of false and misleading advertising is very convoluted very quickly. So this is only a high level overview. Um, at, a, at their core, these laws require trade practices, any way in which consumers tell companies tell consumers about what they're selling to be truthful, non-deceptive, fair, substantiated. A trade practice, essentially advertising, is a broad term and can include anything from labels, packaging, uh, to Twitter posts, TV ads, websites, you name it. Um, in those uh, kind of advertisements, let's call them that, advertisers can't mislead or deceive consumers, uh, whether by affirmative statements, like this is a paper bottle when it's not, or by omission or implication, like implying through a happy chicken image that they're free range when they are really crammed in cages. Um, whether something is misleading is based on a reasonable consumer standard. When there are very specific claims made about a product performance, like this product doesn't contain chemical X or it is growth hormone or antibiotic free, um, those claims must be substantiated with some kind of evidence like testing. And Adrienne discussed this a little bit in the context of uh, food label regulation already. All right. Now that we know about the kinds of trade practices that are and aren't allowed, uh, greenwashing and welfare washing, what can we do to hold companies' feet to the fire? Well, there are several ways. On the federal level, as you've already heard before, uh, the FTC is the key agency when it comes to combating false and misleading trade practices in general. As Jessica explained, when it comes to food labels specifically, the FDA and USDA have primary uh, jurisdiction. The FTC Act prohibits an advertiser from using unfair or deceptive acts. That prohibition can be enforced by citizens in court. We have to rely on the agency to investigate. Citizens can file complaints, but the FTC is not obligated to act or respond to them. Uh, FTC keeps track of complaints to see if a pattern of complaints arises for a certain company or a certain advertisement. If a lot of complaints come in, they're more likely to take action. And when it comes to environmental claims, uh, uh, FTC has a specific guidance document called the Green Guides, which is currently being updated, uh, by the way. Uh, those could be their own seminar topic. But in brief, they focus on how specific kinds of environmental claims, like statements about energy use or recycled components, can be made. Now, as one example of how this process can work, uh, HSUS in 2018 filed a complaint uh, with FTC about Pilgrim's Chicken's advertising. Um, so not the label, but their website advertising in this case, as you can see um, on the right-hand side. It has a happy little chicken, it has a family farm. Um, and then if you actually go to their farms, you see the second picture there, which is uh, big barns full of chickens crammed together, nothing like the picture above. Um, although they deny any uh, connection to the complaint, Pilgrims changed its website uh, about 10 days after uh, HSUS filed the complaint, and I'll leave it up to you uh, to uh, think about that, what you will. Uh, another avenue, and one of uh, ongoing and increasing importance, is using state consumer protection laws, or unfair and deceptive acts and practices, UDAP regimes. 
Um, these very widely in scope, and I cannot possibly talk about them all, um, but there's a link on this slide that um, has from the National Consumer Law Center where, you know, there's a, a they have a nice overview and a report. Um, these regimes typically have agencies enforcing them, like uh, on the slide here, the California Department of Consumer Affairs or state attorneys general, sort of similar to the FTC, but many provide private rights of action. That means they can be useful avenues for nonprofits or individual consumers to enforce truth in advertising. Um, there are hurdles to overcome in challenging welfare washing, humane washing, or greenwashing claims in, in courts. Uh, nonprofits organizations have to prove standing, uh, for example, which can be tricky. Defendants often raise the defense of federal preemption, especially when challenging food labels, because as uh, Jessica and Adrienne and, and have discussed, the federal government tightly regulates labeling on food products, especially you know, meat and dairy, uh, and those laws have preemption provisions. Uh, not all regimes, uh, finally, offer easily obtainable injunctions against false advertising, for example, um, so remedies uh, can be uh, difficult as well. That said, there are states where successful lawsuits have been brought, often resulting in settlements that are favorable to consumers and animals. Um, I will highlight uh, our friends ALDF uh, in 2021 obtained an important ruling in D.C., and they were able to go forward in a lawsuit challenging Hormel's natural claims, which potentially opens up the D.C. CPPA further um, to challenge humane washing uh, claims. Uh, there's some examples on the right from HSUS. Back in 2008, HSUS challenged... Uh, claims that department stores were selling fake fur. Uh, when you analyzed it, it was actually real fur made from real animals, so blatantly false uh, advertising, uh, which ended up in a big settlement and an injunction against use uh, of uh, misleading advertising relating to fur. And we currently have a lawsuit running against Smithfield over uh, its claims relating to its treatments of pigs uh, in gestation, for example, in gestation crates, uh, which Adrian actually mentioned earlier. The last regime I'm going to touch on real quick is the uh, Better Business Bureau or BBB National Advertising Division or NAD. It's a private self-regulatory system, has existed for decades, and it's become quite a popular and successful way to challenge false and misleading advertising. It's often used by competitors to challenge uh, competing advertising by other companies, but it can and has been used successfully by consumers and nonprofits. Uh, in general, it's a non-binding voluntary process, though if companies don't want to receive a complaint and don't want to participate or reject a decision, um, complaints can get referred to the FTC, which tends to give such complaints a higher priority. Um, the process is somewhat like, like arbitration. If an advertiser um, doesn't agree with a complaint, uh, a private set of decision makers reviews the claims and the evidence. Um, that process is maintained confidential until a decision is made and final decisions are publicized and can be appealed. Now, as an example of how this has been used, just a few weeks ago, uh, a sustainable food nonprofit was successful in challenging the agricultural giant JBS on uh, what well, you can see here on the slide, net zero 2040 uh, claims and advertising. Um, being net zero is a difficult feat for a company owning millions of methane emitting cows, and NAD agreed and said that JBS could not substantiate its claims that it had concrete plans in place, as you can read here on the slide, and recommended that it discontinue the ads. So. Greenwashing and welfare washing hide animal abuses, uh, deceive consumers, and confronting them through any variety of avenues like we discussed uh, can help bring those abuses to light, uh, inform increasingly welfare conscious consumers, and ultimately help animals. And I think because I'm the last one, there might now be a little bit of time for Q&A, um, but I'll leave that up to uh, um, Becca. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for their very thoughtful and knowledgeable presentations. Uh, we did go a little bit over time, so we do have a built-in break right now before our keynote speaker presentation starts at 1.30. So if people want to go ahead and go on break, you can. If you'd like to stay, um, I know we at least have one question that's been sent in if our panelists don't mind staying on. Awesome. Okay, uh, so if anybody wants to, to go get get a water, get a snack, anything like that, feel free. This is being recorded. So if you miss the Q&A portion, you can go back and listen to it later. Uh, so one of the questions that's been sent in the chat is specifically for Amanda. And someone had asked if you could talk a little bit more about the current lawsuits um, ALDF has filed about this subject, specifically the ones that you've mentioned in your presentation. Yeah, of course. Um kind of like an update in terms, I'll, I'll give kind of like a, a what has happened to this point. Um, so we we filed in Missouri first. Um, we lost our motion for preliminary injunction and we appealed that to the Eighth Circuit. Eighth Circuit said some weird stuff that was kind of obvious if you 
the like actual text of the law saying that because of how it was drafted, the Eighth Circuit isn't convinced it like does anything or applies to anyone. It like is limited to people like selling slaughtered products and meats as a part of a food plan, which is kind of like when you think about like a frozen dinner, like meat can be a part of that. And so they're like, I, it's very clear that this was supposed to apply to plant-based meats, but the way you drafted it, it doesn't. So we're kind of almost at square one in that Missouri law. Uh, we're still in discovery and our motion for summary judgment and dispositive motions is due in May. So that's upcoming. So we'll hopefully have even though that's been pending since 2018, we'll hopefully have something quickly on that one. Arkansas, that case is is over. We won on an as applied basis as applied to Tofurky, but hopefully because of the uh, court's language, if anyone tried to input like enforce that law, uh, other plant based meat companies would be able to use that kind of as persuasive in their own cases. Um, and then in the uh, Louisiana, that was my favorite order on motion for summary judgment. It was all of the law was stricken on a uh, facial basis. Um, just for folks that haven't had con law yet or something, um, as applied as, you know, in the limited, it, as it's being applied in a certain situation, obviously a facial being stricken on a facial basis is saying that that law is unconstitutional no matter how the state tried to apply it. Um, the state appealed that uh, our win on our motion for summary judgment in Louisiana. Oral argument was early February. Um, it was rough. <laughs> uh, we had a, a panel of uh, a, a Trump appointee, a Reagan appointee, and uh, a Bush appointee. And I, you know, it was unexpected in the sense that we feel very strong about our standing in that case. It was very clear that the law was meant to apply to plant-based meat producers. And yet that was the question that the uh, panel was mostly asking me was like, but it doesn't apply if you're not doing anything wrong. The way that the law is structured is really interesting. It says like, you can't intentionally misrepresent by doing this laundry list of things. And it like defines that in that laundry list exactly what our plaintiff Tofurky does, which is, you know, represent something, arguably represent something as meat because it doesn't have a safe harbor carve out for if you have qualifying language. So if you use the term meat, even with a qualifier, in theory, you could be uh, held liable under this law. Um, so we're still waiting for a ruling there. As I said, the oral argument was just last month. Um, in Oklahoma, our motion for summary judgment is due May 30th. The state already filed its motion for summary judgment, so ours will be across uh, MSJ. Um, and like I said, that's a little bit different of a case because our main cause of action is dormant commerce clause, because again, that law regulates things that are occurring, you know, completely outside of Oklahoma, had nothing to do with Oklahoma. Um, the preemption issue is also kind of front and center in that case. Um, and again, because we aren't sure what a product's name is and because it applies to marketing, but it doesn't have that safe harbor carve out for like qualifying terms as opposed to, as it applies to marketing, it just says for labels. Um, we also have a due process void for vagueness cause of action. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we have a couple more questions that have popped up. Um, this one, someone is asking if you could talk a little bit more about the faux fur, but actually real fur complaint. Um, they're also wondering if there's any link to that complaint available so that they could read it. Uh, of course. Um, so this happened back in 2008. I was not at HSUS then, but I read the complaint. Um, I'll post the link. I saw that question, so I'll post the link in the chat right now. Um, I think it just goes to host and panelists. Well, let me send it to... I think you can post it in the general chat, Becca. It's available online on uh, HSUS's website, um, at least the DC one. I think there was a there were ones in other states. Basically, what happened is that um, you know uh, big department stores, think Neiman Marcus, Gillards, um, were advertising coats uh, as having faux fur trimmed. Uh, you know, were be as being faux fur trimmed, um, selling products as fake fur. And then when you when you well, for some of them, it did a little bit between the products, some of them had a label inside that said rabbit fur, uh, even though they were advertised as faux fur. And some of them were just advertised as fake fur. And when you did a test, which HSUS did, um, it tested as rabbit fur or what's called raccoon dog fur, which is often used. Um, so not fake, real, real products. And that is obviously a harm to consumers who are um, seeking to buy animal free products and are not getting them. Uh, so uh, it pretty, I mean, in my mind, pretty obvious false advertising case uh, in D.C. and elsewhere. And uh, you can Google uh, the results. Um, uh, department stores ultimately settled after some litigation um, for damages and an injunction. 
to not be able to sell uh, products anymore that were labeled as fake fur when they are not. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, I can also take the second question if you like, Becca. Okay, so there was a question asking, um, for lawsuits filed related to consumer protection for misleading ads, what damages are asserted? Are tort-like claims a basis uh, with consumers as plaintiffs? Are class action suit commonly filed? Okay, that's a very broad question. Um, it depends on the state. As I said, states vary very widely in how their consumer protection laws operate. Some states, like D.C., um, and I mentioned the ALDF case, have a standing provision that allows nonprofits to sue basically by themselves, not needing a class of consumers. Um, and uh, in DC, you can sue uh, just for an injunction, you don't need damages. In other places, you do. In our faux floor complaint, for example, um, there was a class of consumers identified uh, and HSUS members and damages were asked for because people bought fur and said, well, we didn't get the product we asked for. And so that, you know, we should get damages. So it, it varies. Um, but yes, if you have a class of consumers, if you can identify a class of consumers, you can assert damages if they bought a product that they thought were get, they were getting and they didn't. Um, but you don't have to under certain regimes. And those kinds of regimes like the C DC CPPA are then interesting vehicles to uh, bring lawsuits that maybe don't aren't great for damages, but would be uh, very well uh, qualified for like injunctive relief because there are false statements out there that we wanna um, get at, get off websites and Twitter ads and uh, packaging. Um, if I could just hop in there, I wanted to add that even though, you know, I think for, for people who file these types of lawsuits, injunctive relief, changing the marketing or the practices themselves are of course like the, what we want ultimately. Exactly. I think that damages are a really good tool because um, it makes the company take the lawsuit very seriously. And ultimately, if you are in settlement, that gives you something to leverage against the injunctive relief. You know, you can give up, you know, like certain fees and things like that for better injunctive relief. Also, I think that even though class actions sometimes get a bad rap and people are like, why did I get this check for two cents? Um, the company had to spend a lot of money to send out that check for two cents. And a lot of people got a check for two cents or whatever it is. I mean, there's Cypre funds, which, you know, was beyond the scope of this. But I mean, I think that having to return ill-gotten gains and unjust enrichment is is key. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't just say like, oh, sorry, we did that in the past and go forward and get to keep those profits. So I think that that kind of acts as a stick um, that is essential so that people don't see how long they can get away with things and say, okay, we'll just promise to change it going forward. So. Yep, absolutely. It depends on the context of the case, but great pressure tools to get companies to stop their practices. Great, thank you all so much. Uh, it's almost 1.30 and I think that we've answered all of the questions in the Q&A section now. Um, if anyone has any questions that they wanna ask specific panelists, feel free to email me. I'll drop my email in the chat um, and I can go ahead and forward them along to our panelists as well. Uh, but thank you all so much for your wonderful presentations. This was fantastic. And uh, Join back in just a few minutes. We're gonna go ahead and start our keynote presentation soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think I got everybody situated in the right spot now. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our keynote presentation. So it is my absolute honor to present our keynote speaker today, Joanne MacArthur. 
Uh, Joanne is an award-winning photojournalist, sought-after speaker, photo editor, and the founder of the not-for-profit photo agency, We Animals Media. She's also visited over 60 countries to document our complex relationships with animals. She is also um, has been awarded very many awards <laughs> for her fantastic work, um, and this includes um, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, Nature Photographer of the Year, Big Picture, Picture of the Year International, the Global Peace Award, and many others. So I want to thank Joanne MacArthur so much for being here with us today, and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you for the warm, oh, let me bring this mic over here. Thanks for the warm welcome. Becca, can, I, can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, before I start, I want to show that um, I my animal law conference mugs. <laughs> this is ALDF. Uh, here is one from Toronto. And here is the mug I'm currently drinking from, from GFI. So a little shout out to some of our panelists from earlier. I think that uh, animal law conferences invite me because I'm on the front lines with your clients. I'm bringing those stories uh, back, back to you all. And I'm happy to share a few of those stories today and to talk about animal photojournalism. I'll spend 20, 25 minutes doing that. And I think I will start sharing my screen. Hmm. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Now, um, can some, I can't see any of you now. Can you all shout and let me know that you're seeing full screen the kangaroo? Yes, we are. And are you seeing my next slide or just the kangaroo? Just the kangaroo. Wonderful. Okay, here we go. Uh, today, I will be speaking with you about animal photojournalism, uh, its role in what we're all trying to achieve for animal equality. This is a project uh, called, first of all, um, before this was We Animals Media, it was We Animals. This was a personal project for about 15 years. It was me out in the world with my camera, uh, I've been to over 60 countries now to document our complex and painful and fraught relationship with animals. And uh, I wanted to be more strategic. And so I took this work I had made and put it into an archive, which is free for all of you to use. I noticed some of the work was in one of the presentations. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, so We Animals became We Animals Media. Uh, we have 13 or 14 staff now. We have 95 contributing photographers from around the world who have contributed to over 20,000 images and videos, which you can use. <laughs> and uh, we photograph the hidden animals, as we call them. Who are these hidden animals? Well, um, you know, they're not so much wildlife, companion animals, and so on. They are the animals we have a very close relationship, like the animals on our plates, like this chicken. Uh, the animals who are producing products like eggs, which of course we eat by the billions every year. So we investigate these places, uh, lots of factory farms. We go to places where natural disasters are happening. You'll see that um, a lot of the images are uncredited. Those are my images. Images that are credited uh, belong obviously to that person uh, being one of our contributors at, at We Animals Media. So here you're seeing two pigs who have escaped from the floods in North Carolina a few years ago uh, during the floods. And unfortunately, they were round up and sent to slaughter. Uh, a lot of zoonotic diseases right now, 75% uh, of these are caused by our human caused interactions with animals and a lot of farmed animals. Um, we dispose of these animals by the millions now in many countries. Uh, bullets are more expensive, gassing is more expensive than digging a hole in the ground and uh, putting these animals in alive and burying them. Maybe this is the part where I, I say trigger warning. I think possibly a lot of you are familiar with my work and you know that 
we photograph, you know, what people don't want to see. And so there are some very upsetting images in this presentation. I also want to note that you'll see this is credited to anonymous. And the reason for that is because when we are working in our own countries, we are particularly susceptible to lawsuits, not so much when we're traveling somewhere and we can leave quickly, but uh, I believe that over 10 of our contributing photographers have the pseudonym or remain anonymous for their own protection. We photograph the animals who are used for their skins and their furs, like you see here. This is at a fox farm and at a factory farm of alligators. We photograph the working animals. We document the hidden animals who are in plain sight. What I mean by that is when we attend a rodeo, a bullfight, a zoo, an aquaria, we're, de we're generally there for our own pleasure, our own interest, and not to really engage with the animals who are right in front of us. This is Kiska. She's made the news recently because she passed away just last week or the week before from a bacterial infection, but she was wild caught. And she lived in this tank that you see here for, for 42 years. Ironically, this tank uh, was part of an area called Friendship Cove. And we photograph the animals who have lived in or who live um, in research facilities. This is Ron. He is a chimpanzee who lived in a five by five by seven foot cage suspended above the floor before he was rescued. I photographed him at Save the Chimps here. And uh, he had a big sanctuary space to roam around in and play with his other chimpanzee friends, but he chose to stay indoors and make this nest every day. I love photojournalism. I love that it can have such a, can, it can be such a powerful tool for advancing animal advocacy. Uh, both historically and today, it's a tool that brings war and conflict and important issues home. I include these images because they are very well known and that's what we're doing in animal photojournalism, which we're going to go into. The thing about photojournalism, though, is that it's about the human condition, whereas animal photojournalism, or APJ, as you'll hear me refer to it, includes everybody. And um, so my agency and I decided that we would lay out a description, an essay of what APJ is. And, you know, honestly, I thought, who am I to, to create a new genre of, of photography? I'm going to be the laughing stock. But on the contrary, people are calling themselves animal photojournalists, and I'm being invited to talk about it uh, in the media, at academic conferences, and podcasts, and so on. So I'm really pleased that it's taking off. This next image is quite uh, confronting, and what I will do with the next series of images is uh, give you some, some descriptors and some examples of what APJ is. Uh, here we are at a slaughterhouse in Thailand. This is uh, obviously a pig being uh, being clubbed before slaughter. APJ covers the broad human-animal conflict and its resultant ecosystems of suffering. From public health and environmental crises to zoonotic viruses, APJ shows that animals are inextricably linked to many areas of current global concern. APJ aims to encourage swift and necessary change on behalf of the beings in the frame. I love that. Of course, journalism has to be objective, but we all know that people take on these stories because they care about them. And so in a sense, animal photojournalists claim that because we are encouraging swift and necessary change. Here, another anonymous image of uh, ducks being dropped into a hole in the ground and live, burial, live buried because of a zoonotic scare or outbreak rather. Here in North Carolina, we have a flooded factory farm. APJ is relevant to current news and it shapes conversations about its subject matter. It's used to further political, philosophical and scientific thinking. It is invested in contributing to current worldwide campaigns to lessen and end animal exploitation. What I found horrifying during this shoot is that the animals, an estimated 5.5 million animals who drowned and died 
in these floods were written off quite often with insurance as loss of inventory. And here we have an industrial farm in Finland. My text here reads, animal photojournalism descends in part from conflict photography in that the photographer is exposing a story that is kept hidden from the public by political and economic agendas. Thus, their images are necessary catalysts for change. Coming back to that activism bit. This photography demands radical empathy and self-awareness. I love this claim. I love that we've included this. APJ demands radical empathy and self-awareness. Viewers must decenter themselves and consider the world through the eyes of a different species while holding the truth of humanity's undeniable role in the story. As with conflict photographers, we put ourselves at physical and psychological risk in order to document a practice or an event. Uh, this is me climbing up on a truck at the Turkish-Bulgarian border to photograph who's inside. And, um, you know, I mentioned the physical and psychological risk, but of course we are putting ourselves at greater legal risk now that, now that we have more ag-gag laws uh, popping up in North America and globally. In common with humanitarian and conflict photographers, we also suffer long-term psychological effects as a result of bearing witness to the violence and injustice towards others. This is a colleague and I recently at a fur farm in Canada. What we've done, we wanted to create a calling card for animal photojournalism, a proof of its launch into the world. And so we created a really big book, a five pound book called Hidden Animals in the Anthropocene. This is not just my work this time, it's the work of 40, uh, 40 photojournalists. And you know, this, this work, as you know, can be quick to be written off uh, as emotional, irrational, uh, biased, and so we wanted to make, you know, a really hardcore, unflinching, well-researched book. Uh, this book is, I think, 320 pages. Um, I, and you know how I said, uh, I was a little sheepish about, oh, there's that word. I shouldn't use that word. <laughs> I was a little shy about, about uh, creating a genre of photography. And I was also a little shy about creating this typical kind of conflict photography book, because who's going to buy it? Who would want this book? Um, we fundraised for, I think, 67,000 US for this book. And we actually reached that amount at three and a half days. And we ended up raising a quarter of a million dollars for this book. The sales continue to go well because, again, uh, it's, it's a book and it's subject matter whose time has come. We have a foreword by Joaquin Phoenix. We have a lot of well-researched information in the book. We have very well-known images that have been shot over the last few decades, like this one by Jan van Eyken, a Dutch photographer who was in a, a processing plant. This is the last male chick to drop into a macerator. Uh, we kill millions of chicks this way every year. Um, their crime is to be born male. They're less useful, and that's why they're ground up. This is a phenomenal image by Ator Garmendia speaks for itself, but uh, what people don't know is that these animals are often highly sedated repeatedly over years so that we can interact with them in this way, and that one of the side effects of sedation is partial or full blindness. And this incredible image by Timo Stamberger, it evokes, of course, the, the horrors of recent history but what we don't know is that um, this is actually a chicken farm. This work can certainly paralyze people. We know that um, we wanted to create a book that was truth telling and unflinching, but we wanted something actionable. So we included this beautiful fold out pamphlet called The Way Forward. And it talks about how, how we can do you know many, many different things, including top right, change the law. Uh, there's lots we can do to, um, you know, change things for animals, as we know. And I'm very proud, and I want to say that this book did win one of the biggest accolades in the world, Photography Book of the Year by Pictures of the Year International. And I say this because I'm proud, but also 
because, uh, you know, I really want to enforce this, this inspiring moment. Um, you know, the door, we are all opening the door to animal causes. And so I feel like this is a really great place to be in history. You know, a lot of us wonder who should have to look at these images. We don't want to, they're confronting. They make us question all of our actions and our traditions, and that's very uncomfortable for us. But there's a book written about this, and it's called Regarding the Pain of Others. It was written by political activist Susan Sontag. And she asks, who should have to look at these unpleasant images? And her answer is, and I absolutely agree, anyone who can help. And when it comes to animals, that is absolutely all of us. I want to share with you some of our, um, let me just, there we go. Uh, some real world examples of how animal photojournalism has changed policy minds and history. As recently as uh, late last year, this very image helped close this very farm. Uh, we, I, I work closely with animal justice in Canada here. And one of our strategies is just to continue hammer on fur farming here to help create a national ban the way we're seeing in other countries. Uh, we focused on Quebec, uh, our province of Quebec, who has, uh, they have three remaining fur farms. And after our big investigation and media push, this one closed, yay. <laughs> Uh, other examples. So here you are seeing a farmhand show us their product. Uh, another example of these euphemisms and how we how we consider animals. But in 2013, a team and I posed as a buyer of macaque monkeys in Southeast Asia. This work went to the CITES Convention with Cruelty Free International. Uh, we love working and partnering with NGOs, by the way. But uh, once this was presented at CITES, two of the three farms that we visited closed down. And to this day, there continues to be no official trade in long tail macaques out of Laos. Uh, now in December, uh, 2021, after sustained pressure on elected officials by the Environment and Animal uh, Society of Taiwan, uh, which used our investigative footage, uh, Taiwan issued a ban on new battery cage farms for egg laying ducks. This was the first ban on cages for laying ducks at a national level in Taiwan. Uh, we went, we visited several farms. Sometimes we have five minutes to take images before we have to leave. Sometimes we have an hour. This was a fairly quick shoot, but we were so pleased that we were able to help them move their campaign forward to this level. Uh, you saw the image of the man clubbing the pig earlier. This is from that same day. Uh, in response to this story, which was published with the Guardian newspaper, Thailand's Department of Livestock and Development has stated that uh, it would take action to apply strict enforcement in slaughterhouses countrywide. Um, the Thai SPCA reports that at least three illegal slaughterhouses were closed down because of this work. And uh, beautifully uh, inspired by this work, an epidemiologist formed a new animal NGO called Catalyst. And I really love this story. Uh, we feature a lot of women on the front lines of animal advocacy. So it's not always the bad news, but we do good news stories as well. And uh, we published an interview with Chao Hui, who's a Buddhist nun and a vegan animal rights activist in Taiwan. Uh, the international support bolstered her work and reputation, leading to her being awarded the Niwano Peace Prize, which comes with an $180,000 gift towards her work. Uh, I mean, I don't want to take too much credit for that, but she really insisted that, you know, our, our reviews and support of her work and our photos and video helped her achieve that. So I think that was, that's just really lovely. And also, you know, photographers are very influential people. So that's also what I love about promoting animal photojournalism is that we are infiltrating the photo world and we're pulling wildlife and conservation photographers and photojournalists into animal photojournalism. We're normalizing it. We're winning awards for this work we're doing, like recently at Wildlife Photographer of the Year. And, um, and so I feel like we're really gaining traction there and, you know, again, normalizing, looking at these images, normalizing, having this subject matter in the media and in the news. 
So in closing, I want to tell a very short story about uh, one of the rescues I got to attend. And uh, it starts here, it's probably five in the morning and a plane has landed. The plane is carrying 1100 birds. The backstory is that there was a farmer on the west coast of the US and he uh, kept hens for eggs and he kept reducing the number of birds he kept because he just felt like it was unethical. He was no longer comfortable with this farming because this is what farms look like these days. This is what a typical hen layer facility looks like. Um, this particular barn had 100,000 birds in it. Now he had 3000 remaining birds and he called the sanctuary and said, can you take them? Now, of course, that's a lot of birds for anyone to take. And so um, sanctuaries across the US banded together and discussed it. And some could take 10, some could take 100, some could take 1,000. Now that plane took of the 3,000 birds, 1,100 to the East Coast, uh, going back to that image. So the plane has just landed. An anonymous benefactor has paid for this charter flight. We didn't at the time know who that was. So we lovingly, lovingly referred to them as the Hennefactor. So here they have they have landed. We've gone from 3,000 birds to 1,100 birds to 10 per k 10 per crate, and you can see that on the, the bottom right, people are just so excited to get these birds out and free. And here we are at Farm Sanctuary. These birds are touching down on grass for the very first time. A lot of them needed a lot of medical help. And so here you see one of the birds receiving subcutaneous fluids while the others roam around and explore the grass for the first time. All of their nails look like this because this is what nails look like when you've been standing on caged flooring your entire life. All of the birds had mites. So they were given a mite bath to reduce um, those bugs on their skin. And here is one one of our clients, one of the 10 of the 1100. <laughs> I turned off my phone there, sorry. Uh, one of, you know, one of the 10, one of the 1100, one of the 3000, but really that's to say one of the billions of animals that we use every year. And um, these, these are the girls, <laughs> these are the animals who we're fighting for. You can see um, this girl who she was, she was named Jolene, by the way. Uh, you can see that she's been de-beaked, which is a common practice uh, for animals kept in, uh, for birds kept in cages. And, um, and we all know that, you know, these, these numbers that we hear, the billions of animals, we can't feel that. And it's the same for humanity. We, we can't feel, you know, a thousand or even 10 or even two. So we all need to bring forth those individuals and in all of the talking that we're doing and all the presentations that we do, because we can identify with, we can connect with, we can feel what one is. And with that, uh, I thank you. I will conclude my presentation. And I also wanna leave this slide up for just a moment because uh, this is our website. It's where you can use uh, over 20,000 of our visuals. Um, we have a master class there on animal photojournalism. We have a lot of resources, editorials, all sorts of things there for you to use. We are there as a resource for the animal advocacy movement. And uh, as I mentioned, we do love partnering with people and NGOs on investigations and uh, on all sorts of programming. So do feel free to reach out to me and the team at any time. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and for being with us today. And of course, for all of the amazing work that you do. Uh, we are gonna have a brief Q&A session. So if anyone in the audience has a question, feel free to use the Q&A function to ask it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question to get us started. I'm curious about how you and other animal photojournalists gain access to the industries where these animals are being held and how can you do that safely? Thank you. That is one of the top questions we always receive. People are very curious about entering factory farms, especially. Now, these aren't places that are open to journalists generally. Um, 
because they don't, you know, that's why they're windowless and, you know, far from the road and they don't have tours the way you might have tours of a farmer's market, you know, easily accessed. Um, these are places that, you know, confine animals, as you've seen, uh, that are generally very unclean. Um, often there are the bodies of other animals in the cages, in the pens, in the hallways, excuse me. And, um, and so we often have to go in surreptitiously or under false pretenses. I don't like doing that. Uh, it's dangerous. It can cause a lot of, you know, <laughs> legal ramifications for us and um, a lot of money spent on, on uh, protection and trials and, and so on. Um, these places should be open to all of us. But as we know, there are more and more ag gag laws now that prevent people like me or whistleblowers to even take photos from uh, public property. Um, these laws are often deemed eventually as unconstitutional and overturned, but in the meantime, you know, they put us in a precarious uh, position. Uh, it's always great when you can go in asked uh, uh, with, an, with an ask or invited, but it's not always the case. And, you know, sometimes we rely on whistleblowers as well, uh, people who are working there who can funnel information privately to us that we can then publish. So that's the short answer. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another question is this work, while it does seem extremely rewarding, also seems to expose these photojournalists to some incredibly difficult situations. Um, are there different types of methods for coping? Um, do we animals media have like kind of established methods for this? How do people go about that? We don't have established methods, though we list resources on our website and some of those resources point towards uh, coping, whether it's you know books or, or articles that they can look to. Um, what I would love is to have some like international protection for us. And that means, you know, money, uh, this has yet to be established. I would love for there to be a foundation that is, you know, that provides funding specifically for advocates who are in trouble uh, legally, you know, photojournalists who are in trouble legally, because we take on a tremendous amount of responsibility and risk. Uh, this can cost us, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we're putting ourselves on the line for this because we're so passionate about it. Um, so I think in that respect, we go farther. Uh, it's not a competition. <laughs> But we <laughs> than other activists, I was going to say, but like we go really far with the risks that we're taking. Um, and and also, of course, so there's the the legal and financial risks, but the psychological ones as well. And so I do a lot of speaking about that. It, interestingly, in our master class, we uh, we have a, a an episode on coping, and we ask people ahead of time, what questions do you want to have addressed with regards to coping? And that's our longest episode. We received a slew of questions, and that episode I think is 45 minutes, and it's me sitting on my couch petting my dog and looking at the questions that are coming in and just and just answering them. But there are a lot of resources out there, thank goodness. Great, thank you. We're almost to the end of our time, so I'll finish with one final question for you. And that's just, if someone's interested, how can they get involved with We Animals Media? Oh, great. Okay, well, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we exist because of monthly donors, one-time donors, small and large grants, so there's that. If people want to pitch stories to us, we have a link on our website where they can just go click on uh, work with us. And whether you want to contribute existing images, uh, write for us, uh, send us a pitch on a sheet we'd like to do, we have guidelines for that. Um, we have a lot of volunteers for many aspects of the things we do, even from like book bookkeeping and mailing things and um, and lots and social media and uh, things like that. So go to our website and you'll see a lot of opportunities there. Great, thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for being here today and willing to give your time to speak with us. We greatly appreciate it. And now we are going to go ahead and start our second break. So if you want to go ahead and grab some food and water, um, we're going to reconvene at 2.30 for the start of our second panel. If you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to send a message to either myself or Kat via the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of the day. Um, 
uh, which would be obstacles for animal advocates, censorship and punishment. This panel will focus primarily on obstacles animal advocates must overcome in their pursuit of strengthening protections uh, for animals. We are incredibly grateful to have five amazing panelists serving on our panel today. Each panelist has prepared a presentation. At the end of each presentation, or at the end of all the presentations, we will have a question and answer session, um, time permitting. So please hold all of your questions until the end. And again, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A function to um, submit your questions as well. Our first panelist is Jody Medoff. Jody is the General Counsel of Mercy for Animals. Prior to joining Mercy for Animals in 2020, she practiced for 15 years in corporate law um, and as an in-house counsel, including at a Fortune 500 company and a technology healthcare company. Jody has a, an MBA in addition to her JD. Additionally, prior to attending graduate school, she worked in federal law enforcement as a special agent. Our second pan panelist is Jamie McLaughlin. Jamie is an animal rights and welfare attorney. She holds a master's of law in animal law from Northwestern School of Law um, of Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. She received her JD with a certificate in public interest law from DePaul University College of Law in Chicago, Illinois. Her concentrations are animal status and the impact of US industrial animal agriculture models on the environment, humans, and non-human animals. Currently, Jamie is working towards an LLM in environmental law, natural resources law, and energy law at Lewis and Clark. Our third panelist is Chris Green. Chris is the executive director of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. He is also the former chair of the American Bar Association's TIPS Animal Law Committee and previously was the director of legislative affairs for the Animal Law Legal Defense Fund. Chris regularly testifies at legislative hearings on animal protection matters and has been quoted on animal legal issues in dozens of major media outlets. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the University of Illinois, where he created the college's first environmental science degree. Additionally, in 2022, Chris received the American Bar Association's Award for Excellence in the Advancement of Animal Law. Our fourth panelist is Kelsey Everly. Kelsey is an Abrams Fellow and Clinical Lecturer in the Law in the Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic at Yale Law School, where she teaches and supervises students pursuing impact litigation and developing policy initiatives to increase government transparency, defend the essential work of news gatherers, and protect freedom of expression. She was previously a legislative policy fellow at the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. Before that, she worked for more than seven years as an attorney with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, where she led state and federal litigation, interfaced with the media and general public and oversaw internal programs and personnel. Our final pan panelist is Dr. Crystal Heath. Dr. Crystal Heath is a general practice and shelter veterinarian and a graduate of UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Compelled by the animal agriculture industry's campaign to destroy her reputation, she founded Our Honor, a nonprofit that supports veterinary students, veterinarians, and other animal professionals in speaking they're conscious to create more ethical systems that consider the best interests of all species. She's also the found on the founding committee of veterani veteran veterinarians against ventilation shutdown. I'd now like to welcome our first panelist, uh, Jody Medoff, to get us started. Thank you. And let me share my screen. Sorry, I'm a little low at this. Okay. Thank you so much for having me on this distinguished panel and at such a great and informative event. I'm General Counsel at Mercy for Animals. Just a bit about Mercy for Animals. We're an international farmed animal protection nonprofit currently operating in the US, Canada, Brazil, Mexico, India, and Hong Kong. And we are working on plans for further international expansion. Mercy for Animals exists to end one of the greatest causes of suffering on the planet, the exploitation of animals for food, in particular, industrial animal agriculture, aquaculture, and fishing. Our mission is to end industrial animal agriculture by con 
by constructing a just and sustainable food system. Our vision is of a world where animals are respected, protected, and free, and this drives the work that we do every day. Mercy for Animals' work also focuses on strengthening the animal advocacy movement, and as an activist and animal advocacy organization, we face many obstacles in the work that we do. Today, I'm going to give a broad overview of factory farming and discuss about how the lack of laws to protect farmed animals creates an obstacle in the advocacy work that we do, specifically in the undercover investigations work. So nearly 10 billion animals in the US are raised and slaughtered for human consumption each year. 99% of these animals are raised on factory farms or concentrated animal feeding operations called CAFOs. I'm repeating that number again, 10 billion animals. So you may think there should be legal protections for these animals, right? However, there are no federal welfare laws regulating the treatment of farmed animals. You may ask, what about the Federal Animal Welfare Act? It protects animals and therefore must also protect farmed animals. But no, farmed animals are not protected under the Animal Welfare Act. The USDA FAQ page on its website even provides, while USDA considers the humane treatment of animals to be important, the USDA's regulatory authority does not extend to farmed animals used for food, fiber, or other agricultural purposes. Not only that, it also provides, most livestock production industries in the United States have developed and implemented science-based animal care guidelines. Assurances that animals are being raised according to these guidelines are provided through voluntary third-party audits rather than legislation. So the way to ensure that animal care guidelines are being followed is not only by third-party audits, but it's also voluntary. There's no protection, no oversight. So then you may think, well, at least states have animal cruelty statutes. Farmed animals must be protected from cruelty. That isn't the case either. Many state animal cruelty statutes exempt farmed animals and most ex explicitly exempt out common farming practices, no matter how abusive or cruel they are. As long as they are commonly used, that typical is enough, typically is enough for it to be exempt from the law. So what, what's factory farming and what are CAFOs defined as? The Oxford language defines factory farming as a system of rearing livestock using intensive methods by which poultry, pigs, or cattle are confined indoors under strictly controlled conditions. The United States Department of Agriculture defines CAFOs as an intensive animal feeding operation in which over 1,000 animal units are confined for over 45 days a year. The meat industry's goal is to maximize production and minimize costs. So you might think, okay, they talk about con controlled conditions, being confined, it may not seem so bad. But that's not reality. What is reality for a factory farm? So I've tried not to include specific and graphic descriptions, but some of this may be difficult to hear. Animals are generally kept in deplorable and horrific conditions. Most are raised indoors with minimal light, intensively confined, packed so tightly in overcrowded areas that many suffer and die from injury or disease before even reaching the slaughterhouse. Open sores, chemical burns, broken wings and limbs, either they die on their own or they're killed, often in cruel ways and tossed aside as trash. As one example, chicken on many farms, they're often bred to grow so fast that they can't support their own weight and often die from organ failure. Some of the killing, some of the common actually farm killing methods are culling, thumping, ventilation shutdowns. Two common intensive confinement measures are gestation crates for mother pigs and battery cages for chickens. Gestation crates strictly confine pigs so tightly that they are pre prevented from lying down comfortably or even turning around. They can develop sores on their feet, legs, and udders. They also gnaw on the bars of their crates from stress, which results in even more sores and severe pain. Battery cages house egg-laying hens. It's been compared to having less space than a sheet of letter-sized paper on which the hen lives her entire life. 
they're unable to spread their wings. They step on each other. There may be also deceased birds right next to them that they're stepping on. Disease can quickly spread. This is the life of a farmed animal. In addition, farmed animals are not protected during transport. Transport trucks pack the farmed animals into poorly ventilated, crowded trucks without food, water, bedding, or relief from extreme weather conditions. Animals can die during transport or arrive so sick that they're unable to stand. The transport laws require that animals are given food and water if they have been on board for 28 hours. Not only is that too long of a time to be subject to these conditions and deprived of food and water, but this law isn't even adequately enforced. Oh, sorry, and actually I should have done that slide. Okay, so many organizations, including MFA, conduct undercover and drone investigations that expose the realities on the factory farms. The struggle is that the majority of time, this is not illegal behavior, what we see. It can't be reported to law enforcement for cruelty as no laws have actually been broken. What they do is considered industry standard. Therefore, the lack of laws and protections for farmed animals can make our advocacy work quite difficult. MFA and other animal protection organizations also strongly support an anti-carceral approach. If there's any enforcement of anti-cruelty laws, it is often applied against the farm workers and marginalized communities. Instead, what we need is systemic change, and we are unable to really drive the systemic change from our investigations work due to the lack of legal protection for farmed animals. Instead, what we do is we can show the realities to the public and hope to create social change and better company welfare standards. That can have an impact, but it's not the systemic change that is desperately needed. And as I've noted here again, you know, some of this may be hard to hear, but what a lot of these undercover investigations show is the routine and frequent brutality, painful physical mutilations without anesthesia, clipping of tails, um, animals being hit, punched, stabbed, or stomped. And again, these actually tend to fall into commonly used farm practices and are not illegal, and the farmed animals do not have any protection. So I may have painted a dire picture, but there has been progress and there is hope for change. Congress has put forth federal legislation to amend the federal farm bill, the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act. Some of the points that the IAA seeks to address are to hold the CAFOs accountable for the damage they cause when their systems fail, it also addresses mass on-farm killing of animals, dangerously fast slaughter lines, and ineffective stunning methods, which are some of the cruelest practices in the meat industry and are currently legal. The IAA will also help protect farmed animals during transport to the slaughterhouses by setting new standards and shortening that 28 hours to requiring rest after eight hour periods. Many states are also enacting anti-confinement laws that ban gestation crates and or battery cages. You may be aware of the Prop 12 case that is currently pending in the Supreme Court. Prop 12 would essentially ban the sale of meat from animals in California that had been kept in intensive confinement. However, these anti-confinement laws continue to be challenged by the ag industry. There's also some question as to whether anti-confinement laws actually work. As our population continues to grow, the demand for meat, dairy, and eggs is anticipated to significantly grow as well. <clears throat> our jobs and the protection of farmed animals is urgently needed. According to a 2020 study conducted by the ASPCA, approximately three-fourths of U.S. consumers believe that the government should support farmers in transitioning to more humane practices. We can all make a difference in the life of these living beings and we will continue the work and fight for legal protections for farmed animals. Thank you. And I put up my email as well. Any questions or anyone wants to reach out, please feel free. And that's my presentation.
I'm Jamie McLaughlin, LLM candidate at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon, and vice president of the International Association of Lawyers Animal Law Commission Working Group. The following presentation provides an overview of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, the federal act designed to prosecute animal advocates for direct action against companies that engage in practices that harm animals. In the 1980s, direct action environmental and animal advocates negatively impacted businesses engaged in logging, animal research, fur, agriculture, and other industries by calling attention to animal mistreatment and environmental degradation. In response, these industries lobbied to pass federal legislation that would favor their business practices and silence activists. This 1988 letter is an example from the Fur Retailers Information Council, illustrating how they created a database of animal activists and worked with the Department of Justice to assist in targeting activists who were adverse to their business interests. During the 1990s, critical thinking of animal and environmental social movements was gaining broader public support. Although alleged crimes of activists could be prosecuted under existing vandalism, trespassing, or property laws, industries wanted a special law designed specifically to protect animal enterprises. So these powerful industries retaliated against activists by lobbying Congress to enact the Federal Animal Enterprise Protection Act of 1992, legislation designed to prosecute activists who targeted companies engaged in harming animals and the environment. Following September 11, 2001, animal industries used the looming threat of terrorism to renew focus on animal activists and push for amendments of the act. In May 2004, John Lewis, the Deputy Assistant Director for the FBI, appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee and claimed the most dangerous domestic terrorist threat to the U.S. was special interest extremism, including the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front. In 2006, an amendment to the act created the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. This amendment expanded potential victims to include tertiary victims and imposed new sentencing guidelines depending on property and damage amounts. Conviction under the 2006 act requires that the defendant is acting in interstate commerce to damage an animal enterprise and must either damage or destroy real or personal property of the enterprise or a person connected with the enterprise, or through the course of conduct intentionally place a person in reasonable fear of death or serious injury to that person or a member of their family, or conspire or attempt to do one of those things. The Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty or SHAC 7 case is one of the most notable cases prosecuted under the act. This was an Animal Enterprise Protection Act case because the alleged crimes occurred prior to the 2006 amendments. This case is U.S. v. Bulmer, the subject of documentary film, The Animal People. Activists were accused of engaging in activities that included protesting, black faxing, phone calls, emails, letter writing, gluing locks shut, graffiti, and animal rescue, including removal of 14 beagles from a testing lab and taking dogs and ferrets from a lab animal breeder. They were accused of conspiracy and linked to more aggressive actions, including breaking ATM machines, sinking a yacht, breaking windows of homes and offices, bomb threats, throwing paint, spraying cleaning fluid in one person's eyes, although no long-term damage was done, personal threats to family members, and even sending an undertaker to collect a still living person who was being targeted. While this case was prosecuted under the 1992 Act, it provides insight on how courts can interpret the 2006 Act. More than 100 FBI agents were employed in this investigation, and more wiretaps were used against the people associated with SHAC than any other counterterrorism investigation in U.S. history. Huntington was later rebranded in Vigo. In Vigo's Beagle Breeding Facility in Virginia is currently the subject of a Department of Justice investigation for numerous Animal Welfare Act violations. In Vigo was purchased in 2021 by Innotive Inc. The good news is that around 4,000 beagles from Invigo have been confiscated and rehomed. In U.S. v. Johnson, defendants accused of property damage at a mink farm in Illinois were charged under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. They claimed it was a violation of their substantive due process rights to be labeled as a terrorist under the act. 
for what amounted to nonviolent property crimes. However, the court held that there is no liberty interest to not be labeled as a terrorist. Rational basis analysis was applied because being labeled a terrorist is a non-fundamental liberty. The court reasoned that the Congress intended the act to allow prosecution of direct actions such as bombings, death threats, arson, and so the use of the word terrorism in the statute was not arbitrary. Although the Johnson activists committed nonviolent crimes, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act prosecutes both violent and nonviolent crime. Those convicted for nonviolent crime may be labeled as terrorists due to the act's terrorism title. Daniel Andreas San Diego was believed to be linked to Shaq and allegedly threw smoke bombs in front of two San Francisco Bay Area biotech companies with ties to animal experimentation labs. No one was injured. He is the first animal or environmental activist to be added to the FBI's most wanted list. Those convicted under the act will have their cases reviewed by government anti-terrorism employees. An FBI audit of U.S. Bureau of Prisons has indicated that the Bureau of Prisons does not consistently identify terrorist prisoners. The 2020 audit revealed that inmates were often mischaracterized, with the BOP often relying on media coverage or an internet search to identify an inmate's ties to terrorism. Being labeled as a terrorist by the act increases the probability of being branded a terrorist. The terrorism label could potentially result in prison communication and visitation restrictions that further impinge upon liberty interests of those convicted under the act. Overcharging under the Amer American, sorry, <laughs> Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act may create a chilling effect for legal protest. There have only been a handful of cases prosecuted under the act. However, violence against activists has been escalating. This illustrates the time from inception of the act to the first murder of an activist by U.S. law enforcement. Sunday, January 18, 2023, is the first time an environmental or animal activist has been killed by law enforcement while protesting within the United States. Law enforcement named, claimed that Tortuguita, a non-binary activist of Venezuelan descent, was ordered out of their tent by law enforcement and did not comply. Tortuguita was killed and one officer was shot. Body camera footage of the shooting has been released but was not taken in the immediate vicinity of the shooting. Witnesses claim that they heard multiple continuous rapid fire shots, not an exchange of gunfire. Furthermore, one person is heard on the body camera recording saying, man, you effed your own officer up. So at the present time, it is undetermined whether Tortuguita discharged a weapon or if a police officer inadvertently shot a fellow officer. Animal environmental activism does not exist in a vacuum. Stop Cop City has an important social justice component relating to the use of the Wilani Forest, which is just southeast of Atlanta, Georgia. The proposed Cop City site is on land belonging to the indigenous Muscogee people before they were forcibly removed in the, in the 1800s. Additionally, it was the site of a former prison farm, the ruins of which are seen here. Building Cop City here will destroy green space within this community and subject residents to the sounds of police training, including repetitive gunfire. Activists are pushing back to prevent this from happening. We must remember that the law is not objective and neutral. It is the product of cultural influence. Those who influence culture also impact the law. Because cultural shifts can change the law, it isn't surprising that industries fear successful grassroots direct action movements. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act is meant to silence activists and stop an ideological bottom-up cultural shift which could be bad for business. There is no one right way to advocate. I don't support illegal activity. Social movements need legal advocacy as well as direct action. So it is important for us to work together as organizations and advocates using both top-down and bottom-up approaches to shift culture and the law. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act could be abolished or at the very least the word terrorism should be removed from the act to avoid branding activists as terrorists and stop its chilling effect on the First Amendment protected activities. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.
Hi there. Uh, I am going to give a history of uh, ag ag laws and how we kind of got to where we are. I'll just start my timer here so we keep everything on track. Um, so, uh, you know, it's all about transparency. Uh, transparency is important for anyone who uh, cares about, um, you know, the way their food is made, uh, labor, uh, environmental issues uh, across the board. I mean, transparency is generally just think, seen as a. Uh, um, hold on one second. I'm trying to change my view here. Uh, okay, I guess this works. Um, so, uh, okay, hold on a second here. Um, so here's uh, an early ag whistleblower uh, you may be familiar with, Upton Sinclair. Uh, he wrote The Jungle in 1906, and he initially, the point of this was to, to really inform people about the plight of immigrants uh, in, in the United States uh, early on and, and kind of the, the conditions that they experienced. Um, but it turns out everyone was much more interested in what he had to say about the meatpacking industry and the unsanitary conditions and the labor conditions and what was happening to the animals. Um, and so his book actually led to several reforms, including the passage of the Meat Inspection Act. Uh, and he famously said, um, I aimed at the public's heart and I ended up hitting them in the stomach. Well, it turns out he did both. Um, currently, 94% of Americans will agree that animals raised for food on farms deserve to be free from abuse and cruelty. Um, but however, agriculture wants exactly the opposite. As you see here in a 1999 textbook on contemporary issues in animal agriculture, uh, the author who is a, uh, an ag professor at University of Oregon states that uh, one of the best things modern animal agriculture has going for it is that most people haven't a clue how animals are raised and processed. Uh, for modern animal agriculture, the less the consumer knows about what's happening before the meat hits the plate, the better. Uh, so you can see how they really don't. It is they don't. The more people know, the less they will want to consume their product. Um, and so one way that that we counteract that, uh, or animal activists had have counteracted that, is through undercover investigations. Uh, I'm not going to show this video uh, from 2013, but as you can see in the warning for it, uh, the, this video shot by Mercy for Animals at a farm in Wisconsin says includes graphic and sometimes bloody scenes. It shows cows being kicked, beaten, and stabbed, as well as cows being dragged by ropes. Uh, here is just one uh, still image from that video and looks almost like some sort of alien abduction thing with this poor cow who is too sick to, to stand or walk is being lifted by this end loader. Um, and so at this one investigation in, in Greenleaf, Wisconsin, with just a single investigator, uh, four, as a result of this investigation going public, four of the employees were convicted of multiple counts of animal cruelty. DiGiorno Pizza said it would no longer accept any more cheese made with milk from the Weiss Brothers Dairy, which had 4,500 4, cows. And Nestle, we think of them as a chocolate milk company or something, but they're actually the world's largest food company with over $100 billion of annual revenues. Uh, they announced it would require all of its 7,300 suppliers to eliminate tail docking, dehorning, gestation crates, and battery cages at hundreds of thousands of farms worldwide. So it's pretty amazing impact for just one investigator at one facility uh, in one state has this impact on hundreds of thousands of, of, of facilities. Um, and when you think in the last two decades, there's been you know well over 100 investigations conducted. Um, but it's not just uh, an issue of, of animal welfare. Cruelty also affects public health. So in 2008, many of you may know about the Hallmark Westland meatpacking uh, case. That was an undercover investigation by the Humane Society of the United States. And that showed workers dragging and using forklifts on down cows too wick weak or sick to, to walk to slaughter. Um, and the outcry led to the largest food recall in US history, 143 million pounds of beef, uh, 37 million pounds of which was slated to go into the school lunch program. Um, even though that was recalled, it was a little too late because most of that beef had already been in, entered in the food supply because of tight supply chains and consumed. But as a result, the next year, uh, the Obama administration permanently banned all downer cows from entering the food supply. And HSUS uh, continued with their litigation uh, under something uh, it's called the, um, uh, the there's a they for for basically committing a fraud on United on the United States by selling food into the uh, selling them food and agreeing not to break the law uh, under their contracts to supply food to the school lunch program, uh, but then they did, and so this massive judgment ended up closing down that company. 
Um, so more on the effects of whistleblowing kind of from the industry themselves, um, Kansas State University, uh, their, uh, their ag department put out this, this, this report uh, called U.S. Meat Demand, the Influence of Animal Welfare Media Coverage. And the breakout quote you can see says, as a whole, media attention to animal welfare has a significant negative has significant negative effects on U.S. meat demand. Uh, another quote from that Kansas State article says, increasing media attention to animal welfare issues tr issues triggers consumers to purchase less meat rather than reallocate expenditures across competing meats. So if they see some of that terrible chicken thing, that's not like they're going to go buy more beef. People actually just eat less meat. Um, and again, this was put out by Kansas State University. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, my great uncle Charlie, who you can see here pictured as a as a baby on the on the left, um, he was the chair of the animal science and dairy science department at Kansas State University for many decades. Um, I have been managed our farm has been our, our our family for 185 years now, and I've been managing it for about the past 25 years. Um, and as a small child, there were a lot of animals there, and interacting with them um, is what really sort of got me attenuated to these issues at a, at a very young age. So how does industry respond to all of this? They decide they want to gag people. They don't want anyone talking about this information that they know that when people find out about, they stop purchasing their product or purchase less of it. So uh, ag, they turn to the legislatures. So um, the first ag gag laws are passed in, passed in early 90s, uh, Kansas, Montana, North Dakota. And these were sort of promoted as eco-terrorism laws. When you can see from these titles, it was all about the sort of the hysteria about lab trashing and, and going in and actually causing damage. And they thought that, you know, taking video and photos might also be a type of damage. Um, but as uh, we see from Will Potter here, you know, the, the problem with, with the biggest threat facing ag gag isn't that activists are breaking windows, it's that they're creating them. Um, and so you see this resurgence uh, of, of ag gag. So uh, as you just heard Jamie talk about um, the uh, American uh, Ecological, the American, sorry, the AAPA uh, then was turned into the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Um, and but the model ATA actually had a federal felony for what we now know as ag gag, entering an animal research facility to take pictures with the intent to commit criminal activities or defame the facility. Now, defamation is always really weird because I mean, the whole point of defamation is you're saying something untrue. So I don't know how like recording something that's actually happening could be framed as defamation, but there you go. But what's crazy is that ag gag was considered too extreme, even for the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. So it was struck from the final version. Um, but in 2010, Alec had it still sort of sitting on the shelf and said, well, you know, let's try this at the state level. So you've got folks like Jody Ernst in Iowa saying, you know, I, I sat around my kitchen table at my whole family farm and I drafted this legislation myself. Like, that's interesting because it's pretty much verbatim what this you know, conservative bill mill actually drafted eight years before, but we'll take her at her word. Um, so the elements of this sort of second round of ag gag laws one was, was to criminalize recording video, audio, or taking photos at farms, um, even by existing employees. Uh, also to criminalize obtaining a job at one of these facilities under what they call false pretenses or with the intent to disrupt operations. Um, and the third is to require quick reporting of suspected abuse within 12 hours and turning over all evidence. So this one is particularly uh, insidious in that it's actually framed as something that's supposed to help animals like we just we just really want to know when there's any cruelty happening so we can get in and fix it right away uh and as you see the animal agriculture alliance who is opposed uh who's a strong proponent of ag gag and, and really opposed transparency said you know these quick reporting bills are one of their strategic focuses and they say you know if you see something say something it's just, it's just that simple well it's not really that simple so the main issue is that when you an undercover uh, investigator has to turn over all their information right away they're going to instantly reveal themselves, and the only uh, evidence that's going to be gathered is at the the very bottom level by the low level workers. So, if you the moment you see one law being broken and have to stop and you know expose yourself and turn everything over, you're not going to be able to demonstrate that there was sort of a pattern of abuse that there's multiple that multiple employees are being told to do the exact same thing, and so you're never going to get higher of the food chain. So, a classic example is if you had the, the DEA and we're trying to do an undercover. Uh, uh, investigation trying to get to sort of drug kingpins or something, and those undercover agents who had spent you know ages getting themselves embedded would have to uh, out themselves the moment they saw like a five dollar hand to hand drug buy. Um, 
Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, we then have a, an Ag Ag 3.0 that emerged in, in North Carolina uh, in 2015. And this was really just sold as like a private property uh, bill um, that, uh, you know, agriculture is not mentioned anywhere. Uh, and it made it a civil cause of action rather than a the state prosecuting someone or criminalizing it. So the drafters thought that this way they might be able to skirt the unconstitutionality because, again, you're not criminalizing something. You're just allowing you know, other people to sue each other uh, with a civil cause of action um, and includes everything, all private facilities, including hospitals, nursing homes. And so you have this large coalition of, work, of folks who are opposed to it. Um, and it passed. Uh, but good news, uh, which Kelsey will probably go into more, uh, was that this was just confirmed uh, at the appellate level was just uh, upheld that it was just struck down. Um, but yet one still exists in Arkansas. So this is the current ag ag tally as it stands now. Uh, as you can see, the remaining states that still have it are Monta Montana, North Dakota, uh, Missouri, Arkansas, and Alabama. Uh, Iowa, again, we just had a, another victory there this year. Um, they're fourth. They've gone through four ag ag laws now, but each one of them has been struck down, as has North Carolina. So uh, my 10 minutes are up. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelsey. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, to Becca and Michigan State University for hosting us today. Um, I'm really excited to be with you to talk about AGAG um, and some sort of directions that spin off from AGAG that I'll um, that I'll explore. So let me just pull up my presentation. Okay. Okay. Well, I can no longer see you, but hopefully you can still see me and you can see my presentation. And I will start my timer here. Um. So yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm with the Yale Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the intersection between animal rights, animal activism, um, and the First Amendment and free speech. So that's, that's what I'll be talking about today. Here's a quick roadmap of, of my, my 10 minutes. Hi, um, um, Kelsey, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I don't know if you can hear me now. Hopefully my audio is working, but we yes. are not seeing your presentation. Oh no, okay, here, let's try it again. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you, Becca. Okay, how about that? Yes. All right, victory. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, that's better. Um, okay, so like I said, here's a quick roadmap of where I'm going um, today. And I'll sort of skip over some of this because Chris has already talked about um, some of the history and um, what I call the taxonomy of ag, -AG litigation and, and the ag, -AG laws. Um, but in general, you, well, maybe I'll just say that the term ag, -AG um, brilliant uh, you know, piece of um, wordsmithing by column, near time columnist Mark Bittman in 2011 he was really trying to describe this trend of laws that Chris described that were popping up all over the country. I mean, Chris didn't uh, describe it, but we the movement um, had amazing success in defeating many of these bills in the legislature, preventing them from becoming law, which was um, which was really great. But these are laws that essentially are shoot the messenger laws. So you know, um, as Jody mentioned, so much of what is captured on video through these um, investigations is not uh, is either not illegal or prosecution or you know um, enforcement of animal cruelty, cruelty laws is very difficult. And rather than address that problem, the industry decided to criminalize the act of collecting the evidence. Um, as Chris mentioned, there's laws across the country currently. There's laws in eleven states. And nine legal challenges have been filed, including three in Iowa alone. Um, this, these challenges were not just sort of random, you know, oh, let's sue here, let's sue there. It, instead, it was really an overarching um, litigation campaign that looked at, you know, which laws are sort of most vulnerable to challenge under the First Amendment. And I'll get into um, get into those questions in a, in a moment, but. Um, you know, which ones most clearly target protected speech 
and are most clearly motivated by animus towards you know, animal rights activists and animal activism. And so that began in Utah and continued through um, the most recent challenge was filed, I believe in late 2021, uh, when we challenged a coalition of, um, of organizations challenged Iowa's third uh, ag ag law, maybe it's fourth, depending on how you define it. Um, and in general, these challenges have been very successful. Um, I, I say, you know, in general, because they're the devils are devil is in the details. Um, but laws have been struck down in whole or in part in six states across four federal circuits, including the fourth, eighth, ninth, and tenth circuits. And these decisions, you know, um, have some similarities, but um, but but some differences. So, for example, Chris mentioned that you know, some ag ag laws uh, target not the, the, you know, video recording that activists or, um, you know, employees do once they are inside the facilities, but the speech that they use to gain access to the facilities in the first place, and more specifically, the false speech. So, of course, in order to get a job on one of these facilities, you can't just walk up and say, you know, hey, I'm with PETA, I'd like to come in. Um, you have to conceal that fact, either through omission or commission. And so, you know, they had this brilliant idea of, of targeting the lie. But unfortunately, when you target um, any kind of speech that, you know, subjects a law to First Amendment scrutiny. And so much of the of the um, cases have discussed, you know, what is the First Amendment protection for false speech? And when is false speech, um, you know, when can it constitutionally be prescribed? And so the circuits have split on that in, in some ways. Um, I'm going to talk about the most recent decision um, in one of these cases, which was um, the decision just a couple of weeks ago, in which the Fourth Circuit um, upheld the district court decision, upheld in part um, and uh, reversed in part, but upheld for the most part, um, a district court decision concerning North Carolina's Property Protection Act. Um, this is a civil statute, like like Chris was describing. You know, many ag ag laws are criminal, but particularly after activists started to have, or um, after our coalition started to have some success in challenging these statutes, uh, legislatures, you know, changed course and tried to prevent those challenges from happening in the first place. And anyone who's familiar with the litigation um, over SB8, you know, knows this in, in Texas, knows this tactic. You know, if if there's no one to sue, then the law stays on the books is essentially, is essentially the, the tactic. And so that's what the North Carolina legislature tried with this law in 2016. Specifically, it provided that any person who intentionally gains access to the non-public areas of another's premises is liable for damages if they exceed, a per uh, exceed their authority to enter. And then the act defines um, acts that exceed the person's authority in a variety of ways, but one of them is, um, is uh, capturing or um, removing an employer's data and using it to breach the person's, the employee's duty of loyalty to their employer. And so the court, um, I'll talk about the, the Fourth Circuit decision, just um, since that's the most recent one on top of mind. Um, the, four, the court followed a sort of familiar um, trajectory when it was looking at this law and um, in terms of, you know, how courts look at you know, an allegation of um, that a law burdens First Amendment uh, activity. Sorry, my cat's con contributing to the discussion here. Um, so first, the, the, the question is, does it target speech at all? And the court said, of course, it targets speech. It targets both uh, photography and videography, but also, um, but also the um, collecting of, of data. So um, the Supreme Court has made clear that the First Amendment protects not only speaking, but collecting information, you know, gathering information. And so the, the North Carolina law burdened both of those things. Um, really importantly, the, the court said there's no exception to the First Amendment for speech on private property. You know, North Carolina was really pushing this argument that, you know, because this law just targets speech on private property, we don't even need to examine under the First Amendment. And the court said, of course, that that can't possibly be correct. Um, so having found that it burdens speech, then the question was, well, what level of scrutiny does, you know, do we need to apply? And the court applied intermediate scrutiny, 
and essentially said, you know, if North Carolina's effort is to protect private property, then it doesn't need this mechanism that sort of targets undercover investigations. Um, and moreover, the law is, you know, vastly over-inclusive because, um, you know, all of this really core whistleblowing, like, you know, collecting evidence related to OSHA violations, and of course, you know, undercover investigations to, to report animal cruelty, all of that is swept up. Um, where, whereas if the legislature's goal was to protect private property or protect trade secrets, you know, it could do so with a far narrower, you know, more of a scalpel and not a, a cudgel. Um, the court declined to, uh, to, um, uh, to give the plaintiffs uh, facial, you know, relief, striking the law down uh, as a whole. Instead, it said, you know, we're not going to go that far, but we are going to say, at least with respect to, you know, the core sort of journalistic activity that your clients are engaged in, that cannot be a violation of the law, you know, a, a violation of the law. I can't, uh, the law can't, can't constitutionally be applied to that activity. So that was a, a, a great um, decision. And the court really sort of upheld the, the importance of gathering information to journalism and to these journalistic enterprises, which is really what, you know, animal, animal undercover investigations are. Um, I'm running low on time, so I'll sort of blast through the next couple of um, slides, but I want to talk just to pivot and say, you know, ag -ag, defeating ag, ag is wonderful and we should continue doing that. Um, but I think people often forget there are, that there are many other barriers to undercover investigations, um, some of which are far more powerful than ag, -ag laws in stopping the investigations from happening. And those, those can be, you know, basically the threat of civil liability and, and massive penalties, financial penalties for engaging in investigations. Um, and a recent California uh, Court of Appeal decision really makes this clear. So in this case, a group of activists um, went onto the field uh, at Golden Gate Fields, a horse racing track in the Bay Area, and they were sued along with direct action everywhere for trespass. And the problem was that direct action everywhere essentially had nothing to do with this trespass. They had put up a petition and they had live streamed the protest, but they weren't the ones going onto the field and they actually put an affidavit in saying, you know, we have nothing to do with this. And they tried to use California's very strong anti-slap law, which is supposed to protect people who are sued because of their expressive activity. Um, but the court said, no, you were sued for trespass. You were sued under the theory that you're vicariously li liable for the you know, trespasses of these activists. And so therefore you don't get the benefit of, um, you know, of the California anti-slap law. You don't get to dismiss, you know, you don't get to just dis get dismissed from this lawsuit at an early, at an early um, time. You have to go on and continue litigating it, which means that anytime there's a protest and someone, you know, br breaks a window, the organization that is responsible for it can be sued and cannot get that um, get that suit dismissed quickly under these uh, statutes that are meant to protect expressive activity. Um, and the Supreme Court, California Supreme Court, declined to review this case despite a broad coalition kind of sounding the alarm about it. Um, I don't have time to talk about <laughs> the other dangers, but um, there's also a, a menacing Ninth Circuit decision that talks about. Um, uh, some some liability for another organization that uses um, activism activist journalism uh, to try to you know uncover um, what it believes is misconduct and so there are many uh, many threats to activism um, which paints an uncertain legal landscape. Thanks. Hope y'all can see that. My name is Dr. Crystal Heath, and in my day job, I am a shelter and veterinary and a dental practice veterinarian. Um, and funny enough, in vet school where I graduated um, at UC Davis, they taught me that these animal law programs were a threat to our profession. Um, so I too, like uh, Chris, grew up on a small farm and. Now I spend my free time mobilizing veterinarians to address the harms of modern intensive animal agriculture. Uh, the veterinary profession sets the 
standard for how animals are treated by society, but it also legitimizes practices in farm animals that would be considered criminal animal cruelty if done to dogs and cats. The, this recent Vox article details the divide that exists within our profession and how those of us working to, to advance change suffer professional backlash for our efforts. At the start of veterinary school, we recite uh, this oath written by the American Veterinary Medical Association. And it says, we swear to work for the benefit of society through the protection of animal health and welfare and the prevention and relief of animal suffering. But is the AVMA actually obeying their veterinary oath? Today, a single industrial style chicken barn will house upwards of 40,000 birds. And it wasn't always this way. In the past, if you put this many animals in a single shed, they would die from stress, fighting, and disease before you could ever make a profit. And with advances in veterinary med medicine, genetic selection, feed additives, antibiotics, and vaccines, we can pack more animals into buildings and make them produce more meat and eggs than nature ever intended. And now we raise over 9 billion chickens per year in the United States. And we slaughter over 130 million pigs per year. And the majority of mother pigs are housed like this in gestation crates where they're kept a total of 114 days during their gestation. And this article from 1976 highlights the mentality that laid the foundation for what we see today. It tells readers to forget the pig is an animal, treat him just like a machine in the factory. And that is exactly what we did. Historically, this triangle is the model through which the veterinary profession viewed the world with man at the top and various species ranked below there for the man's benefit. But what are the consequences of this worldview? We have drastically altered the biodiversity of our planet. Now 70% of all birds on planet earth are farm poultry and 60% of the biomass on this planet earth is farmed animals. And we have lost 83% of our wild animals and 50% of all plant species as we repurpose land to feed livestock. In veterinary school, we were we we learned the concept of, of one health, that plant, animal, and environmental health are all interconnected. But are we actually uh, putting the concept of one health into action? Because of our interactions with animals and encroachment into wildlife habitat we are seeing an increasing number of new emerging diseases. Why is this happening? 75% of emerging human diseases come from animals and the pandemics of the past from the 1918 Spanish flu to the 2009 swine flu to COVID-19 all came from our interactions with animals. And when you have thousands of genetically similar animals packed into warehouses in close contact with humans, that creates the perfect environment for viruses to flourish and mutate and possibly infect humans. And now we are experiencing the worst avian influenza outbreak in history and more than 58 million birds have been killed. And on farms, these animals don't just pass away, we kill them to prevent the spread of the disease. And the methods used are brutal. During this outbreak, one of the most common methods known as ventilation shutdown plus was to seal a farm, pump in heat and steam and wait for the animals inside to die many hours. And in some cases, it took eight hours for the birds to die. And even after that, workers would have to go in and wring the necks of the survivors. Imagine animal shelters killed unwanted dogs and cats by locking them in hot cars. But during the avian influenza outbreak of 2015, there was this a great deal of scrambling to try to figure out how to respond. And veterinarian even threw sick birds into wood chippers. So after that, the AVMA realized that they need to provide some guidance about how they went about this. And they compiled a panel of experts and created this document that lists preferred methods of extermination, methods to be used in constrained circumstances, and methods that are not recommended. And preferred methods are supposed to be less brutal methods. Ventilation shutdown plus is a method to be used in constrained circumstances only, but it became one of the most common methods used last year. And these charts compare the methods used in 2015 with the methods used in 2022. And now we are increasingly using heat stroke based methods of killing 
over those preferred methods. And those are those red shaded areas. So why does it matter? The USDA looks to the AVMA guidelines to set policy and indemnity payments. And some less cruel methods used in Europe aren't even listed in the guidelines. So the USDA can't use them and producers are only compensated for losses if the methods used are listed. One such bailout recipient was billionaire Glenn Taylor, who owns Rembrandt Farms in Iowa. He received $11.3 million in public funds for depopulating his flock in 2015. And this year, his farm was infected yet again. So how did ventilation shutdown make it into the guidelines in the first place? This was the result of a single unpublished study paid for with a thousand, hundred, and hundred thousand dollars from the U.S. Egg and Poultry Association. I'm sorry, this video is quite graphic. This is video from that study. Um, and this was done at the Prestige Department of Poultry Science, named after Prestige Farms, the poultry and pork producer at North Carolina State University. And they put these birds in boxes and hooked them up to electrodes and pumped the boxes full of heat and steam or carbon dioxide to see how long it would take the birds to die. So this is what happens. Corporate interests give money to our research universities who then perform research that centers corporate interests. And then the results of those studies are used by the AVMA to create their guidelines. The USDA uses this policy to decide how to kill animals and then how to distribute public funds. And the industry can then tell the public that they're using veterinarian approved methods of depopulation. So what happens when veterinarians want to advocate for change? More than 1,500 veterinarians signed on to Veterinarians Against Ventilation shut down, asking the AVMA to reclassify this method as not recommended. And we followed the AVMA's rules and sent in a petition to the House of Delegates asking them to, to reclassify this. And unfortunately, 99.1% of the House of Delegates voted to not take action and pass the question back to the panel on depopulation. So this was done in 2020, and still it has not been changed to this, to this day. And in, in order for future member, uh, so they, they didn't want future member driven petitions to advance. So they changed their guidelines so that now it takes 200 signatures to submit a petition when it previously just took 50. And we submitted yet another petition. Um, it, and we got 278 signatures from AVMA members and they refused to even hear it this time. And then realizing that they were on shaky ground for denying us, they they changed the manual to stop any future petitions from going forward. And I talked to several delegates who had no clue about this change. And um, Dr. Thea Johnson heads the, uh, the animal AVMA and she has close ties to the animal agriculture industry. And at a conference, she called on a supposed friendly audience to provide her with data to support leaving ventilation shutdown in the guidelines. And the AVMA periodically puts on a symposium where new life ending research is discussed and it's known as the Humane Ending Symposium. Many of us wanted to see what was happening regarding depopulation methods. And we, we tried to sign up and then we, we got emails saying that we were not allowed to attend. It seemed like they were saying that due to lack of space, but then our colleagues who signed up after us who were less vocal about this issue were granted attendance. So who sponsored this symposium? It was Cargill, the, the largest private company in the world and the largest agribusiness company in the world, as well as Charles Rivers Lab. So it's big ag and big pharma. And the AVMA claimed to bar us so that attendees, including those who raise livestock, could share their experiences using depopulation methods without fear of reprisal. And this is just classic gaslighting that we've seen before. And it implies that we are somehow harmful to our colleagues when in reality, we are actually the ones who face reprisal for trying to advocate for a change. And the backlash continues for me. Recently, I was barred from attending the AVMA legislative event. And unfortunately, and, but fortunately, the international community is deeply concerned by what's happening in the United States. And now there is this sort of 
British versus American Veterinary Medical Association battle. The British Journal published several articles criticizing the AVMA for their recent behavior. And this editorial discusses us being barred from attending these events. And ventilation shutdown is just one example of the many cruelties the veterinary profession legitimizes and the barriers that exist to changing policies. Others like gestation traits, raw bra production for farming, intensive confinement, deep baking, certain slaughter practices all have the endorsement of the AVMA. And this quote exemplifies the barriers we face to change. Susan Lieberman um, of the Wildlife Conservation Society says, the impediment to One Health in the past and moving forward are entrenched economic interests. But time changing, this was the veterinary school class of 1970 who advanced the model of modern intensive animal agriculture under the ethic of treating animals like machines. But this is the UC Davis class of 2023, and they care about animals, justice, and the environment. And I hope that we can empower them to push back against the entrenched economic interests that harm animals, the environment, and public health. I founded our honor to create an organized network of professionals who are able to formally challenge harmful policies. And we believe that the veterinary profession should adhere to their oath and work for the best interests of others, no matter their species. And ultimately, if we protect animals from suffering, we protect our own species too. And that's all. Thank you so much to our second round of panelists on all your really engaging presentations and for your time and research on these topics. Um, we have a little bit of time before we finish up here for some questions. Um, there is a question in the Q&A um, for all panelists, anyone who's interested in answering, um, that asks if you all agree that the examples of this censorship and punishment, such as ag, law, ag laws, terrorism, categorization of or civil liability, and undercover investigations, if you would categorize that as lawfare. Anybody wants to answer? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, um, I don't, I haven't thought about it that way. I mean, I guess you could think about it that way. I, I, I think that's actually not giving it enough um, credit. I would say it's part of a, a scheme that goes beyond the use of the legal system, but, you know, obviously um, political and social influence and using, using their power to try to shut down voices of critique. So law, lawfare is only one small part of that broader system. And I'd like to ask a question of Crystal, actually. Can it's my understanding that something only like 4% or maybe less of uh, veterinarians and AVA members even engage in large animal practice. And so it seems odd that you've got this professional organization taking these massive positions that are contrary to the wishes of most of their rank and file members um, when so few of their members even engage in that. Yeah, seeing how the the livestock and exploitative industries have worked the system to get a bigger voice, get a bigger microphone than the rest of us. Um, they, there's all these, these allied organizations that are part of the AVMA and like the bovine practitioners, there's the small ruminant practitioners, laboratory animal practitioners, uh, swine veterinarians, and they all, all of them have a seat on the committees, but there's only like the feline practitioners in the American Animal Hospital Association. Those are the only like dog and cat allied groups. So the vast majority of seats like in these various committees, like on the welfare committee, the, the welfare committee is predominantly like livestock, laboratory animal medicine, you know, and a couple of seats, a small animal. So that's how they've gotten big, huge microphone. And it's just influence are, are really, um, you have, ties to these corporate interests. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. And Dr. Heath, while we have you, um, there's a couple questions uh, for you as well. Uh, somebody asked, why aren't there more vegan and animal rights activists veterinarians? Um, that's an interesting thing. Like 
first of all, like there's just self-selection. A lot of vegans don't want to become um, veterinarians. A lot of animal rights activists don't want to become veterinarians because, you know, they think, oh, I have to use my animals. I have to see animals suffering. You know, more compassionate people don't want to do that. Um, they also, all of the prerequisites, you know, in school involve maybe killing animals. I know I had to participate in a lab where I had to uh, do surgery on mice who would be killed. I had to piss a frog. Like it was really bad. Um, and so that, you know, creates the self-selection problem. But there's also like, I have talked to several people who um, there's actual gatekeeping that happens. Um, one person I know of, she's a vegan and animal rights activist. And she knew like the sensitive nature of how to get into vet school. You know, you don't want to say that out loud, uh, but her friend didn't know that. And so he actually um, and told uh, one of the people who was on the admissions board, you know, you should really let her in. She loves animals so much. She's vegan, but he was a pork producer and said, a vegan will get into that school over my dead body. Um, and that's, the reality that exists, there's a pork, there's a producer, not just a producer, but any sort of livestock producer on all of these admissions committees, making sure that their interests will be protected as well as the animal researcher too. Wow. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and one more question for you while we have you, Dr. Eve. Uh, somebody asked why the AVMA does not want to change their policy regarding ventilation shutdown after all of this backlash they're receiving. Um, they they haven't changed and it kind of it more has to do with the culture of the AVMA than anything else I mean they they had these panels they proclaim you know 60 experts looked at this and like yeah nobody likes ventilation shut down but this is a last resort this is the only thing that they they could possibly do but it ignores the fact that even if the veterinary profession said and the AVMA said, you know, this was a method that should not be used. It's not recommended. The, they could still do it, but they couldn't go to and say that they were using uh, veterinary methods. Under current systems, the USDA wouldn't be able to give indemnity payments, but the USDA could always change their mind. Um, so they are really kind of ignoring the fact um, that, you know, they, they have, they could, simply say, no, this is not recommended, um, but they choose not to. And it, it's more, it's become like this ego battle ultimately. And uh, even the, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians in a letter said, yeah, we applaud the AVMA for like, sticking to their guns on this and not backing down to you know, the activist pressure and all of this. So, um, I mean, it's, that's sort of the dynamic here. It's really frustrating and it, um, it's kind of like they they silo their bubble for such a long time, and now you know we're getting a glimpse inside, and they've been so normalized to, to violence against animals. They looked at this and were like, "Okay, this is an acceptable method. It's cheap." And then suddenly we see it and go, "Oh no, this is not acceptable. This is not something we want to do," and they're. They're kind of upset and angry about that. And um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. And there's also a long history here of, of the AVMA kind of defending agricultural practices that have fallen out of favor, even with their own their own members, uh, such as frog, you know, force feeding of, of geese for frog raw, and also um, you know, force molting of, of hens uh, to make, to, I mean, there was even headlines saying, Veterinarians lag behind McDonald's on animal welfare because McDonald's had already, you know, committed to enforce molting, and the AVMA was still recommending it. So, um, yeah, it's a great work that you're doing, Dr. Heath. As caring advocates for animals, I think, um, and it pressure. It took activist pressure to get them to change their stance on forced molting. Dr. Karen Davis did a great job with her New York Times article and her pressure campaign against the AVMA, but there's always this narrative whenever we want to push for better welfare reforms, they always say, but this is a slippery slope, this is an agenda, you know, they are trying to take away our meat and our dogs, they want to, you know, make sure that we don't have dogs in the future, if we give them this one inch, they'll take a mile, that's the thing I hear all the time, and 
all the other people, you know, they're just like, we're, we need to stick up for animal agriculture. We need to defend animal agriculture. So. And with, and with foie gras, it was stunning in that they, it went before their committee and they said, okay, well, they, there was enough agitation. So they, okay, well, we'll kick it down the can. The House of Delegates gave it to their animal welfare committee. They study it and come back and said, after two years, like, yeah, you're artificially inducing, uh, you know, premium, you know, disease and premature death. This doesn't really meet our guidelines. And so it goes back to the House of Delegates and the head of the AVMA at the meeting said, this is important. What we're deciding today is about science versus emotion. We're like, great. We went on the science. Your own scientist said so. Um, and then he said, what we do today is going to have implications for all of agriculture. Like, okay, that sounds like more like policy than science, but keep talking. And they talk themselves mm -hmm. in circles and they decide to overrule the findings of their own welfare committee and still approve uh, for Sphino foie gras, ducks for foie gras, uh, based on the fear that uh, it may lead to other agricultural practices being uh, um, being being uh, banned in the future. And last I checked, fear was emotion. So I don't realize I don't know if the head of the AVMA realized how prophetic he was being when he said this about fear for, about you know, you know science versus emotion. But you know, it wasn't science that won the day that in that, in that, in that regard. So it's 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 stunning that they they probably really do believe that they're deciding on the science, and then they're blatantly saying that they're deciding based on emotion. Yeah, it, it's. it's and it's like just projecting whenever they're they're saying these things about us, like we're based on emotion or we're attacking them when really they're the ones attacking me, preventing me from coming to things, making memes about me, you know, smearing my name on the internet, writing hate hit pieces about me. Um, it's like I am the one suffering attacks here, not not you guys. You're still raking in your your money, um, doing your cruel practices. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, and this question, um, anyone feel free to answer, but I know Kelsey, you were discussing this a little bit. Um, if anyone wants to chime in on other threats to activism besides ag gag laws um, that maybe you weren't able to discuss during your presentation. Yeah, I just to say a little bit more about that. I think many organizations that have done these undercover investigations for years are very, very thoughtful and careful about the way that they do the investigations. They essentially, you know, make sure that they are not breaking any laws when they're going into these facilities and taking jobs. Um, and the only damage that they cause is the damage that flows from the publication of truthful, you know, footage and statements about what's inside these facilities. And that's why ag -Hag laws were necessary in the first place, because it basically it was too hard to prosecute, um, you know, and to to bring suits against um, against activists under generally applicable laws. But in the last couple of years, particularly with groups um, that do do, you know, direct action and, and will, you know, engage in um, in, you know, actions that uh, might be trespass, you know, we're seeing prosecution and, and civil lawsuits under other laws, you know, that that ostensibly don't relate to speech. And that's where you get these questions of, you know, okay, if you if you trespassed and you, you know, engaged in in, uh, in symbolic, you know, um uh you know uh action to protest the mistreatment of animals, you know, what what's the damage for that? You know, and does that damage award have to be analyzed under the First Amendment? And traditionally, the answer to that question is yes. But sometimes courts have been saying no recently. And that um, that raises really uh, interesting and concerning questions for the future of, of activism. Thank you so much for your answers and for your wonderful presentations. We are at our time. So I wanna just say if anyone in the audience has additional questions that they would like to ask our panelists, please feel free to email them to me. My email should still be in the chat from earlier and I'll be happy to pass along any questions to our panelists. Uh, and before we conclude for the day, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I want to thank all of our incredible panelists for their willingness to participate in this symposium, their very thorough and knowledgeable presentations, and of course, their hard work and dedication to this field. I also want to thank our wonderful keynote speaker, Joanne MacArthur, for joining us and continuing to do such incredible work for animals everywhere. And lastly, I want to thank all of the Animal and Natural Resource Law Review's editors and our advisor, Professor David Favor for their encouragement and support that helped make this symposium possible. 
Again, if you have any questions about the symposium or about our law review, please do not hesitate to contact me. Again, my email should be in the chat down below. Thank you all so much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Becca.